May 9th, 2018. The first item on the agenda is approval of the minutes. I had one addition on item four, uh, the second item about the ag program. I think uh, Curry Rosado should be added um, as she was one, uh, the other presenter on that. Agree. Okay. Kurt, any changes? None. Okay. So we have a motion. I would move to uh, adopt the minutes uh, from April 11th uh, with your change. I'll second. All in favor? Okay. okay. The second item on the agenda is going to be <coughs> the uh, the YOAB presentation. So I'm not. Sure. Oh. Hi. My name is Juliette Bonnell, and I'm the Deputy Project Manager for the Master Plan, and I'm really happy to be here tonight to share with you a little bit about the engagement that we've done with youth in collaboration with the Youth Opportunities Advisory Board, um, otherwise known as YOAB. Um, we had an amazing collaboration. I've been fortunate to work with um, Clay Fong as well as Brandon Blue, who are Youth Opportunities Participation Coordinators, and they've connected us with uh, YOAB students. And we had a solid team of four YOAB students who did engagement efforts for the master plan, and um, they did an outstanding job. They reached out to more than 175 of their peers at Boulder High School and Fairview High School, and they shared information about the master plan, let them know what it was about, why we were doing it, how to be involved in the process, and they also gathered valuable feedback about um, high school students' uh, thoughts on what they value about open space and what their hopes and concerns are for the future of open space. And so um, they also were able to kind of summarize their findings from all the engagement that they did, and they provided staff with an update of their findings. And so I'm really excited to have our YOAB student team here tonight to present those findings directly to you. Um, so I'd like to introduce the student team. Um, we've got Kevin Garcia and <coughs> Juan Liu. And Nicalia Faruma is on her way. Hopefully, we'll be here any second. And I also want to thank uh, Alana McClements for her participation. She was the fourth YOAB team member, but she's unable to attend tonight. So, with that, I'll let YOAB students take it away. Here's you. So this is kind of our presentation on the OSMP team values, hopes, and concerns, and kind of the general findings that we received from our surveys at both Fairview and Boulder High School. So our first page, the methodology, we had our three engagement windows, and each engagement windows we focused on connecting with different youth and different peers from different schools. So we first started small within our own YOAB group, where our students from our own leadership team took the survey and kind of had like a general background on what the survey encompassed and kind of the different things that are involved under each subcategory. So then after we cons confirmed our methodology and kind of our findings, we went on to our second and third engagement where we individually went to our high schools and conducted surveys either during lunch or through student-run groups such as Honor Society and other uh, science clubs and kind of distributed surveys as well as give them information so that could, they could fill the surveys out individually online. So this bar graph is kind of the general findings that were received from our surveys and as you can see our data pool is slightly limited but we still had pretty good distribution of data and our top three most popular concerns or choices that came from the surveys were the scenery and natural resources as well as water and flood resources so these were the general focus well as other topics such as acquisitions and fundings and other smaller categories still got student feedback but were less important overall in the surveys 
All right, so the first slide that we focused on was natural resources, and this one was a very popular concern for a lot of you throughout e in Boulder and Fairview. And some of the general concerns that students have were regarding biodiversity, conservation, and preservation of endangered species. So I think particularly in our generation, there is a large focus on kind of under climate change, the preservation and kind of uh, preserving these endangered species or that would otherwise become endangered in future years, especially since the younger generation is witnessing a rapid change in our world and there's an increased desire to kind of help these threatened species or kind of preserve them and save them for future. And another focus was the managing of healthy ecosystems and promotion of biodiversity. So again, that's through the process of <coughs> preservation and conservation, where hopefully natural resources can be kept pristine and keep these natural areas and ecosystems healthy. So since we got so many uh, responses under the natural resources category, we kind of split it into more detail. So as you can see, biodiversity and Biodiversity and other subcategories are kind of divided evenly depending on the student response. And again, like I said previously, the preservation and conservation piece remains a very large part of student body concern. All right, so um, next I'm gonna be doing agriculture. So as you guys know about the farmer's market and how important agriculture is to our Boulder community, um, a this is um, not a huge thing within teens, but kind of in the middle. Um, so some of the key things for agriculture were um, that teens had said was the cost of food is being transported, and so su so supporting local f farmers um, is like a pretty good thing, <laughs> obviously. Um, some hopes that there were were um, that people will take local farming more seriously, less of like a type of thing you take for granted, and how how our open space, many people don't really even know that there's like farming and agriculture on our open space, so. A lot of people want to keep growing more food and take it more seriously. And some concerns that students had were providing affordable means of healthy food um, to, less, to, le to lessen processed food consumption. This was like a pretty big thing. I saw it more than once. But we decided to put that, this particular quote. Um, our next one is acquisitions and funding. And so a lot of people, surprisingly enough, didn't really know very much about the acquisitions and funding for OSMP. Um, they didn't realize how much, of a, how much goes into this and how much money actually goes into OSMP. So some important key points that students said is that um, without it, none of the other things can really work. It's kind of what keeps OSMP going. Without the money and funding, we won't have the opportunity to clean up trails and build trails even. Um, some hopes for the future is that we actually expand the funding. And Boulder is a pretty wealthy town, and so if we can allocate some more funds to um, OSMP, that's really important. And some confirms, concerns about it were that there, wasn't there was insufficient funding, and um, yeah. Um, oh, this is yours, my bad. <laughs> yeah. uh, so the, our next major subcategory was limiting sprawl, and this was actually a fairly popular student response that we got a lot of replies for. And one of the key things that we received was the concern of overdevelopment, and again, kind of that space in between natural areas and urban areas, and how that space is decreasing, and how that could threaten areas of wilderness or areas that should be kept entirely natural. So some of the specific things that we received were avoiding multi-story buildings, and that also plays into the scenery subcategory that I will go into next. But Sometimes students feel like the increase <coughs> of a lot of urban buildings, either in downtown or in just general neighborhoods, they've begun to kind of invade the natural areas. And they've also blocked either the flat irons or kind of pushed into too far into the natural areas. So a lot of the concerns were to kind of uh, create more limitations in these overdeveloping areas and kind of maintain what unique aspects that Boulder has. 
So like I said, the next slide that we're going to is the scenery category. And similar to what I said about the multi-story buildings, people want kind of less disturbance and more opportunities for the views and scenery to be seen. And that could either be preserving the unique features and keeping wildlife, uh, water, rivers, and those things pristine and kind of untouched from the urban areas. So that was a very large focus that students has. So it keeps going back to this, like managing healthy ecosystems and kind of the preservation piece. And that can be difficult under development. So kind of a general concern that students have was to keep what we have right now. And this was a less popular subcategory, but cultural resources was still a very important one that we got some students' responses for. And some of the focuses were kind of keeping the history of Boulder alive and also uh, becoming more aware and also educating maybe the younger generation about the history of Boulder. And some student feedback was maybe talking about the gold rush or the Native American history, such as the Southern Arapaho tribe that initially came to Boulder. And <coughs> stuff like this that has a lot of cultural significance and value, a lot of students said should be kept because they will be lost in future generations if not enforced and educated now. So oddly enough, this is our second um, most popular subcategory from teens. So that's water and floodplains. Um, so we found out that this was because so many families had been affected by the big flood. And that's the reason why this was such a big category. So some important key things that students had said were um, like one for the importance. Um, this is important to me because water is really a valuable resource that is taken for granted and we are running out of it. And I think that that was like kind of something that hit home because I'm from California and there's a drought. And so having water is like a really important thing. And I think that we need to follow that into Boulder kind of um, some hopes. For that is that um, everyone will have access and to it, and people will have more of an appreciation for it since it is taken for granted so much. Um, and some concerns that students had were that pollution that pollution doesn't endanger fish in our creeks and wetlands. Fly fishing is a very big thing, and that's e we're eating it could endanger us. Um, so yeah. Um, the next one was visitor enjoyment, and visitor enjoyment is really important for Boulder. Um, visitors come from all over the world to see our open space, and teens think that find it really important too. Like it's an activity that students do on the weekend. Um, some important things that students said um, were that it's one of the greatest things Boulder has to offer. Um, it's beautiful, our open spaces, and it's awesome that we have the opportunity. And kind of tying back into what Quan was saying earlier, we, the fact that we don't have so much housing up <coughs> on the mountains is really important. And so the visitor enjoyment, people being able to access the trails is really important. Um, some hopes that we had were that trail maintenance continues and there's more accessibility for everybody. So people who have wheelchairs, canes, you know, the trails so that everyone can have the ability to get to them. And some concerns for that is that there's too many people's, people on the trails. And I know that's kind of hard because Boulder's becoming larger, but it's important to students that we don't have as much traffic on the trails. And finally, we have connections with nature. So teams seem, one, seem to want to be more educated about OSMP. So when we were giving out surveys and stuff at Boulder High, so many people didn't even know that there was an organization called OSMP. They know about the open space, they know about the mountains, they know about the trails, but they don't necessarily know all of the work that goes into OSMP. And so I think that um, a lot of students wanted to be educated about the op about OSMP and about open space a lot more. There's not really opportunity, there is opportunities, but it's not as targeted for teens, I from what I've seen, um, to kind of join and get more connected with nature. So um, a big quote is that somebody, for importance, somebody said, I like knowing that we can connect with nature, the opportunity to take a hike or just breathe in the fresh air and see the mountains. Um, I know, I'm sure all of you guys can agree with that, seeing as you guys live in Boulder. Um, 
some hopes um, from teens were to gain appreciation for the mountains and the open space and all of this beautiful land that we have. And some concerns are that people don't care as much about, the cl about classes. They care a lot more about nature, but not about educating people as much. I think we really need to focus on this more. And this kind of touches with what I was saying to start with. Um, thank you. And I feel like ultimately, going back to Nicole's point about connections with nature, youth just want more opportunities to be engaged within the community, especially under open space. So it's something such as connecting with nature, maybe more youth opportunities for youth to be involved in either trail maintenance or other events. So our school personally had this preservation and conservation thing with seed bombs where we got to distribute uh, native seeds and kind of wildflower wildflower plants into threatened areas or areas that are in need of recovery. So ultimately it's about youth participation in these kinds of things. So thank you for your time today. Well, thank you for all the time that you put into, I'm sorry, were you, I, were you done? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, you were, um, <laughs> uh, thank you for all the time that you put into and all the work that you did putting this together and coming here tonight to present this to us. Um, it's a perspective that we don't hear very often and one that's incredibly important because open space um, must have a very long uh, future to it and uh, you know you're an incredibly important part of that. I would strongly encourage you if you're so um, intended to stay involved with this. There's another year or half, year and a half or so left in this project to help uh, sort of define what a lot of that future will look like and the future that your open space will look like. Um, any questions or comments? I would just Three. add on to that that uh, <clears throat> your ability to get people, young people interested in something called master planning is uh, <laughs> pretty remarkable. Um, we have a hard time sometimes getting anybody to be interested in master planning. So anyway, uh, we thank you and yeah, I hope you can stay involved in the uh, volunteer activities and pretty soon start putting together your applications for Open Space Board of Trustees. <laughs> thank you. Uh -huh. And if I could just jump in for a second, I'd like to thank the Youth Opportunity Advisory Board and these students chose this project. This was their choice to pursue this and really appreciate the time that you put in. Growing up a Boulder also helped us <coughs> pull this together and do the training for it. And I think some lollipops might have been involved. Is that right? <laughs> that helped get some of the survey response. <laughs> uh, and also we thought, you know, you see a lot on paper, um, but growing up Boulder, Darren Wagner, Juliet, uh, Chelsea Taylor, they all worked to um, bring the youth voice alive, and rather than you seeing it just on paper, we thought it would be helpful, and we so appreciate that you took part of your evening uh, away from your families. Uh, and we wanted uh, also that you were able to go early so you could get home for dinner. <laughs> so thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, and thanks, Juliet. So I think our next item on the agenda is public participation for items that are not set for public hearing. But since there's nothing set for public hearing, this is uh, if you want to speak to us about anything, um, this is your chance. Uh, I think there are quite a few new faces, so I'll very quickly go over um, some of the, the, the ground rules. Um, I'll call your name. Um, <coughs> you got three minutes, um, and then since there's quite a few people who are speaking, I would ask you to you know, observe the three-minute rule. If you're pooling with someone else, you get five minutes. Um, please state your name and address um, at the start. And um, for the audience, we request that you not uh, applaud or boo or anything like that. You're free to wave your hands with people that you agree with, but we want to create an environment in which everyone, whether you agree with them or disagree with them, feels comfortable uh, speaking to us. And so um, with that, and I, uh, and I may call a number of people at a time so that you can begin to get ready. Um, Russell Hendrickson, followed by Alice Stark, and then Ray Bridge. Good evening. Uh, Russell Hendrickson, 645 Concord. 
I want to talk to you briefly about a subject that came to my attention in the last several months and I haven't gotten around to, to bring it up, and that is there are a lot of equine use signs posted up at uh, the Mount Sanitas Trail System. Um, this is a, a sign right there by the Go Trail, and anyone that's hiked the Go Trail knows it's named Go Trail because it's very difficult. We have hikers go off the edges of this trail every year or two and, and incur serious dangers, uh, injuries. And it's posted for equine use, and, and there's a ridge, two ridges, halfway down that, that make, oh, that's the steepness of the trail with the gully. And there are places like this in the trail that make it virtually impassable by horses. Um, this is the East Ridge Trail with horse signs posted. And if a rider were to go up there not knowing the area and try to ascend Mount Sanitas on a horse, it would be a difficult ride with a lot of perils involved. Uh, this is the uh, Dakota Ridge Trail, uh, and it leads to the stair uh, <coughs> case, uh, which is not something that you would want, want to ride a horse down. Um, the Valley Trail is probably the only trail suitable. Um, however, it's characterized by many young parents with strollers, small children, many dogs, and virtually no suitable parking for trailers. Uh, I'd ask the board to look into the reasons why equestrian use signs are posted at Mount Sanitas Open Space and why senior management has allowed this um, to exist. Um, and in summary, um, I would encourage the board uh, to certainly continue, in full disclosure, my wife's in question, we've had horses our whole lives, um, but to continue allowing access for equine use on appropriate open space land within the system. Uh, but OSMP should not promote equine use on trails with obvious dangers to both the horse and rider. And a sign showing horses are allowed implies the terrain is suitable. Um, and <coughs> terrain amounts to this open space represents a clear danger to both horse and riders and should not be promoted uh, by OSMP uh, for equine use. I'd ask the board to, to look into this and there probably should be some policy. Uh, the rangers must know this isn't suitable land, but these, posts, these signs are posted there, so I would ask you to maybe look into it. Thank you. Thanks, Russell. Alice? Hi, my name is Alice Starrick. Um, I'm a local farmer at 3375 75th Street. Um, I wanted to talk about the, the farmland that's managed by open space. Um, the vast majority of the leases um, seem to be continually awarded to commodity farmers and uh, um, hay farmers for horses. These leases are offered at way below the actual costs of land ownership and local water access, and therefore they represent a huge subsidy um, given to these leaseholders. Um, I see two problems with this. The first problem is that the vast majority of this land is not supporting the stated goals of the department, um, and that local regenerative food farmers with leases, the few, are given a huge economic advantage over the vast majority of local regenerative food farmers who don't have access to leases. 3% um, of the leases actually go to regenerative um, farms. Um, many of these leaseless farmers will fail largely as a result result of a financial disadvantage of not having access to this land. Um, the city open space department could give many more leases to regenerative local food farmers now if they wanted to. Um, city open space staff have told me that they currently have a policy to only offer a lease to one new farmer per year. Um, thus, the vast majority of leases go to current leaseholders, essentially giving them a monopoly. Um, this is going to hugely limit the potential growth of the local food sector um, in Boulder County if, if this policy stands. Um, there are many regenerative local food farmers who want and need these leases very, very badly. Um, many of them will suffer if this policy does not change drastically and quickly. Um, I've also been told by open space staff that the staff is hesitant to offer too many leases to organic farmers because of weed issues and the high percentage of local food farmers that fail. Um, to me, this simply means that the open space department needs to allocate a little more funding to staffing and farmer support um, and a little less to new land acquisitions. 
um, more land will need more resources to manage properly. If you can't manage it properly according to your own principles, then you probably shouldn't be acquiring more land. Um, I'm also greatly concerned by the general understanding and agreement that 90% of all the open space lease winners are chosen before the bids are made um, or read. I've been told this by current leaseholders who believe that they have benefited from pre-arrangements. Looking at some recent bids, this seems somewhat obvious. Bids that look like they were part of an eighth grade class assignment by someone who cares little for environmental stewardship have won over bids that were well crafted and deeply contemplated by farmers that were clearly committed to environmental stewardship. Farmers who do not find the time to create a meaningful plan are unlikely to take the time to meaningfully care for their land. Um, my final concern I would like to mention here is that both of my farms are, are surrounded by Boulder open space, um, city of Boulder open space. In many ways, this is an enviable situation, but it is not enviable for us if, as we have not been able to get a lease on any of these lands. In this case, the open space program may eventually even put us out of business by denying us the ability to grow to a sustainable size. We have even offered to purchase the land with a conservation easement on it, but there appears to be no openness to reconnecting these farm headquarters with their historic fields. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Ready? <clears throat> and followed by Elizabeth Black. Good evening, trustees. I'm Raymond Bridge, 435 South 38th Street in Boulder, speaking on behalf of Friends of Boulder Open Space. Since you are considering both the CIP budget and the master plan on your agenda tonight, we'd like to make a point that is relevant to both and that should also inform your thinking about a number of other matters during your tenure on the board. In a year and a half, OSMP revenues will decline 20% without even considering possible declines in overall city sales <coughs> tax receipts. This 20% reduction is just from the expiration and diversion of dedicated sales taxes. This reduction will inevitably affect the operations of the department and barring the adoption of a new dedicated sales tax by the citizens. That will only happen if we make budget issues clear, which is certainly not the case either in the current budget process or in the master plan overview. Things that people would like to see, for example, and are understandable would be what are the expenditures on habitat restoration annually and are we keeping up? Given the backlog on maintenance of existing trail systems, what are the prospects for reducing that backlog? What will the impact of reduced revenue be on operation of the department? You can fill in the rest of the list, but it's important that people understand the budget ca in categories that they can relate to. Thank you. <coughs> Thanks, Ray. Elizabeth Black, followed by Laura Tyler. Um. Uh, Elizabeth Black, 4340 North 13th Street. Here's some photos from Colorado's Dust Bowl in the 1930s. Here's a picture of Boulder's Dust Bowl in 2009. The Dust Bowl is happening again in Boulder. Here is a 2017 photo of OSMP's Bennett property after a windstorm. What do all these pictures have in common? They are all OSMP properties heavily infested with prairie dogs. Oops, in this 2017 photo, Mr. Redshirt is standing on all the extra soil that his downwind field got from Mr. White Pants' prairie dog infested field. Before the windstorm, the two fields were on the same level. The fence posts were of normal height. Mr. White Pants' OSMP field lost a whole lot of topsoil in the windstorm, as you can see. Here's some facts. Over a thousand acres of OSMP agricultural lands are no longer leasable because they are so degraded by prairie dogs. 
almost 2,000 acres of OSMP irrigated cropland are infested with prairie dogs. That's about 10% of OSMP's agricultural lands. Wow, that's way more land than fracking will impact. How much has OSMP lost in lease payments because of prairie dogs? How has OSMP's soil health suffered? No one knows. Please find out for us. Most parts of Boulder only have about a foot of topsoil. Once that is gone, the land is destroyed. You say you're committed to growing local food. How do you square that with ignoring your thousands of acres of food growing lands rendered unproductive by prairie dogs? OSMP staff admit they are hoping for another plague event to knock down prairie dog populations because right now, that's the only solution. From a public health perspective, hoping that the bubonic plague, the Black Death, will come to Boulder is kind of outrageous, don't you think? If humans, cows, or any other animals were destroying this much OSMP property, you would be all over it. But prey dogs, nope, not gonna do anything. You and I know exactly why that is. It's time to reevaluate the city's no lethal control policy. I know the prairie dog people are scary, but you can be courageous. I know you want to prevent soil erosion, <coughs> eat locally produced food, and be a good neighbor. So please ask council to allow lethal control of prairie dogs on your agricultural lands. Thank you very much. Thanks, Elizabeth. Uh, Laura Tyler followed by Rachel Friend. Hello, thank you for this opportunity for, uh, to address you this evening. My name is Laura Tyler, I'm with the <coughs> Boulder Creek Action Group and I live on Koala Drive in Boulder. I'm here to thank you for your past support of flood mitigation at South Boulder Creek when this came before you last year. And as someone who saw firsthand the potential for catastrophic flash flooding in my neighborhood when South Boulder Creek overtopped US 36, I would like to request your continued ongoing support. It's my understanding that staff is very hard at work behind the scenes soliciting citizen feedback and developing um, some fine-tuned proposals for you to consider next year, um, excuse me, uh, later this year, so hopefully this summer, maybe, um, yeah, hopefully this summer. <coughs> so I would just love to ask that you consider expediency um, as part of your consideration when you're looking at these proposals. We know that another flood is coming, we just don't know when, and we're hoping for action sooner rather than later. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Rachel Friend? followed by Andre Husney. Hi, I'm Rachel Friend, um, here on the same topic as Laura just spoke on. Uh, 4895 Koala Drive is my address. I'm also with the South Boulder Committee, South Boulder Creek Committee Action Group. Um, the house that I bought in 2015 flooded very badly in 2013. Um, there was an elderly couple who lived there. I think the gentleman was 87 years old and they were trapped upstairs until a neighbor could get to them. Uh, the flash flood was so bad that emergency crews could not get on our street. It was the street where, where cars were being whipped away. So um, I very much support South Boulder Creek flood mitigation and appreciate you guys moving planning along and we really want you to um, expedite it to the extent possible because there are still a lot of people in harm's way. Um, so I, I'm not particular about which of your options you choose. We just would really like to be um, safety first. So thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, Andre uh, Husni or Hausni? That's fine. Either one. <laughs> I have some documents here for each of you. Uh, and I also brought my dad along so I could get five minutes. Yes. <coughs> okay. Uh, my name is Andre Husney. I'm a local farmer, and uh, and I'm here on the same issue that Alice uh, it was also speaking on. Uh, OSMP has let us down. We, for the last several years, we bid on numerous properties, 11 properties, and we've submitted excellent, well-developed bids. We put a lot of heart into it. Um, 
We're regenerative farmers. We care a lot about this, and yet we've never been awarded any land to rent. And every time we lose a bid, we would try to find out what we could do to make our bids better in the future. After repeated requests to see the winning bids, which are supposed to be in the public record, we finally were able to get some copies. And that's some of the things that, that I've submitted in there are my uh, summaries and analysis of how those particular bids went. Now, I don't, I'm not privy to all of the bids, but those that I've put in, that represents a lot of data. And then I look at that data, I think it reveals just how wrong the process has been. Uh, we, I'm really happy to see young people uh, uh, like the high school students that came up here speaking about the need for local food, the need for regenerative agriculture, and their deep desire for that. And I think that reflects our community's values overall. But as you see in the documents that I've just given each of you, the proposals that have been awarded for most of the land I think would be shocking to the average citizen of Boulder if they knew what was actually happening. I'd like to take a moment to point out that while I and, the, and some of the other farmers here own several pitchforks. We didn't bring any of them with us. <laughs> and uh, that's because we don't want to burn anything down or get anyone fired. I uh, just want us to do better about improving, following through with what we actually say that we want to do. And uh, I also want to be, uh, to express my gratitude to John Potter over here, who's uh, OSMP Resource and Stewardship Manager. He's been very responsive to listen to my concerns and to, I understand that he is working with OSMP staff to review some of the decisions that have been made and see if changes to the process uh, can be put into practice. Uh, I also really want to state clearly that I'm not against any farmers. Conventional, organic, farming is hard and failure is common. Every farmer has an uphill battle and it's not their fault that OSMP has been awarding, awarding bids to them or, or in the ways that, that it's been done. I'm not against them, but I'm here to question the process. If farmers like me can't win a bid, what kind of farmers are we promoting? I want to just show you here real quick my losing bid. Just if, uh, how do I do this? Okay, is it right here? So let's just look real quick. Here's, here's what a losing bid looks like. It's well researched. I put a lot of heart into it and I, I go into detail. But here's a winning bid. This is for 103 acres. There it is. One, two. That's low effort. This is a conventional farmer who's bidding, to, uh, proposing to spray pesticides conventionally to grow horse hay. Our goals that are stated clearly in the bid packet, the criteria, which, which I, I summarize in there, are greater than that. And how come I can't win a bid? Let me give you a little bit of my story with the time I have left. I'm a Boulder farmer and a Boulder success story. I was born in Beirut, Lebanon, in the middle of a brutal civil war. As a child, I witnessed murder, violence, and experienced dislocation. When my family came as refugees to Boulder in 1984, the community warmly welcomed my parents and helped us to fit in. The kids at my school, however, were not as kind. As the only brown kid in my elementary school, I was bullied, mocked, and excluded. The thing that saved my life was a wonderful farming couple that cared for me. I was at their farm every waking minute that I was not in school. I loved to learn. I learned to love plants and to care for animals. I learned to irrigate from our ditches, to drive tractors and cut hay. Nature saved me. I wanted nothing more than to spend my whole life working outdoors with food and with farming. By sixth grade, I had a huge garden. I got my own bees, chickens, and goats, substantially put myself through college, through my agricultural activities, and began working for farmers and ranchers in the area. Growing up in the shadow of the majestic flat irons, I learned to value ecological rather than exploitative models of farming, and I wanted to do something about the way the farm uh, system was broken. And I began interning on organic farms from New York, Illinois, to France, and doing agricultural projects overseas in the Middle East, in Iraqi Kurdistan, and in other places. When I graduated with honors from Fairview, I got a full scholarship to Deep Springs College, which happens to own a huge cattle ranch. In partnership with Boulder's own Savory Institute, I regeneratively managed hundreds of cattle to restore thousands of acres of BLM land in California and Nevada. I then moved, to attend, moved on to attend CU. I studied environmental and water resource engineering. And then I, in, after college, began working with farmers in Africa. After over uh, a decade, I've helped uh, assist thousands of independent farmers in Africa to, come, uh, to become profitable and lift themselves out of poverty by partnering with them with regenerative agriculture. We've built a co-op with over a thousand farmers in Zambia, thousands of acres uh, with regenerative businesses that are serving commercial customers. We import hundreds of tons of organic, regenerative, fair trade agricultural products that go to places like Lush and uh, which has a store here in Boulder. I'm a leading voice in the regenerative agriculture speaking circuit. I've even been quoted by the Pope when he spoke to the Brazilian parliament about the need to save the Amazon rainforest. 
We have a little farm in Boulder. If a farmer like me can't get land in Boulder after attempt after attempt, how are we ever going to accomplish these goals? Thank you very much. Thank you, Andre. Uh, Kate Lazarov, um, followed by Austin Hamilton. Hi, thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Kate Lazarov. I live in North Boulder, 2854 Calmia. Um, and I'm here to talk on the same issue as Andre. I had the privilege of meeting Andre um, as he's doing some consultation for a nonprofit that I run, setting up um, chicken farm co-ops in the developing world. And I've come to know Andre not only as incredibly kind and generous, but really um, an expert in the regenerative organic agriculture, um, as you just heard. And when I learned that for the last five years in a row, Andre had been rejected bids to expand the Jacob Springs farm, um, I was surprised. And after seeing some of the winning bids that were selected over his, I was shocked and really disappointed in OSMP's decisions. As a Boulder voter, taxpayer, and concerned citizen, um, I really expect all of our facets of government to serve the best interests of our entire community and not just a handful of select, um, a select few. And Boulder voters overwhelmingly want our local agricultural lands to be gone to produce local sources of food through organic, regenerative agricultural practices. Um, and several of the bids that were selected over the Jacob Springs, particularly the King Hodgson, Spicer Watt Webb, and Swartz are non-food producing, proposed to use synthetic pesticides and or fertilizers, <coughs> and one even proposes to administer a potent neurotoxin directly into a creek. Um, this is absolutely unacceptable and runs contrary to the selection process that you have purported to follow. Um, Additionally, given that over 50% of Boulder farm workers are minorities, but close to 0% of those selected for the land lease um, process are minorities, I believe that we need to question whether there may be any sort of institutional racial bias, however implicit, um, as part of that process. Um, your goals in the master plan intro here are their great goals to listen well and inclusively and share information and communicate clearly. And I would urge you to apply these goals to the Boulder agricultural land lease selection process immediately. The bid selection process needs to be open and transparent. The opacity of the selection process and complete lack of consistency between what is said and what is done is not the process that our community deserves. Um, the Boulder, uh, please, please um, review, revise, and make public the selection process. Um, the Boulder citizens, and especially our farmers, deserve a process that is fair, <coughs> objective, and transparent. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Uh, Austin Hamilton. I wanted to just add, because I think there are two more people who are speaking on this issue in about 15 minutes. I may have a question or two on this issue, and so please stick around, if you will. Hi, my name is Austin Hamilton. I live at 1350 20th Street. So uh, I am a student at CU. I'm pursuing a PhD in economics, and I hold a master's in economics as well. The reason why I mention this is not to boast, but uh, just give ballast to the topic which I plan to discuss on. So um, I'd like to start off with economics uh, deals a great with, uh, or great effort with markets, specifically auction markets. Uh, there's a lot of research within economics, primarily on auction design, and that's why I want to talk, <coughs> in, talk about primarily for the first point. In auction design, as in comparing sealed to open bid processes, for example, open bid is something like we, if uh, I bid, I would see what I bid and I also would see what others bid and also how they satisfy the criteria in their entire bid. As compar compared to a seal bid process, which you purely <laughs> implement, uh, where you have, you know, it's closed until the end, right, until it's all decided. And um, I would first like to point out that there's empirical evidence showing that uh, open bid processes uh, increase the bid price by, on average, 1.2 to 9.6 percent, actually for land leasing. There's studies that show this. So that would satisfy some of the concerns of uh, previous comments. Also, I'd like to mention uh, the concerns about transparency as compared to open and closed bid processes. Um, when it's open, it encourages fairness <coughs> because we can see how people are bidding, what, how they satisfy the criterion, and also it, it ensures that the criterion 
are being fully satisfied or the objectives. And then, so the real uh, negative side, a lot of times why they implement a sealed bid process is actually to uh, guard against privacy. In certain business practices, like uh, maybe for large corporations, they have propri proprietary knowledge that they don't want to share with their competitors. For example, if they say, you know, we're going to implement this business, now everyone, every one of their competitors can copy that. But agriculture is a little bit different. And in your case, you actually are supposed to disclose after the fact what the bids were, so <coughs> this isn't a concern. And uh, so that's a pretty weak strength for sealed bids. Also, I would like to mention uh, the World Bank uh, produced this report uh, to be used to help develop if a sealed or open bid process was optimal. And the World Bank uh, concluded that open bids actually decrease collusion and then also uh, decrease corruption. And uh, I don't want to say that that might occur, but it's great when you have open bid process, there is no you know, concern that that might be taking place, right? And then uh, my next thought would be, uh, mentioning about the idea how it maximizes revenue. Now, I think Boulder is an interesting place. Obviously, it's not its primary object objective is to maximize revenue. We care about the stewardship of the land, most importantly, for our future generation and people. So, um, however, it is one of the criterion for many of the bids. And so I would like to, I passed around uh, the bid that Andre had up. So we have this, we have his bid, it's quite lengthy, I passed it around. But specifically, I want to uh, compare these. And then uh, also you got a form here. Just you like can do that be, quickly. Okay, I'll be. I'll do real quickly. So uh, criterion. The first one is proximity. So he lost uh, in regard to proximity. He's less than a mile away from the property. The uh, the winner is actually over 10 miles. Uh, conservation, which is another criterion, wasn't mentioned at all in the bid, and you, you're welcome to read the winning bid. It was strongly mentioned in Andre's, and then the next criterion is local food. The winning bid was for hay. So how does he even come close to satisfying that? when Andre is specifically <coughs> producing, or Jacob Springs Farm specifically producing food. And then also experience. This is the only aspect that the winning bid actually won. And uh, the winner had 35 years experience as compared to 22, which I think 22 years is sufficient to show experience. And the last criterion is the bid amount. So the winning bid was $5,500 when Jacob Springs Farm bid was actually 10,600. So almost double, which I'm a little blown away. Now, obviously, like I uh, uh, alluded to point. prior, that you all don't think primarily about money, but you know that is a concern about revenue generation. So my concluding remarks are uh, open bid process would solve a lot of these problems, and I think better uh, satisfy the objectives of OSMP and their uh, agricultural leasing program. Thank you. Thanks. Sorry, I might have gone a little over. I apologize. Alan Delamere, followed by Nicholas Vinson. Sheila and Alan Delamere, 525 Mapleton Avenue. Um, my favorite topic, you've seen me many times on open space parking. Next slide, if I can make it happen. <coughs> ah, something's happened. Ah. <coughs> Okay, you're familiar with this picture, which I've shown many times with the 311 uh, site is pretty dominated by open space parking, and it's not small at all. So you've seen also that one, the upper parking lot at OSO uh, provided uh, safe parking for 35 cars. So recently, uh, they have submitted new plans. So that's really one of the crux of the things that I'm bringing up today. They've removed two of the buildings on the open space other section. They still have, in dark, you'll see, they've still got a lot of buildings and a lot of earth moving going on in the, uh, the southeast corner of the open space other. So uh, basically, they've set this up as a gated <coughs> community. They're not claiming it to be a gated community, but you can see that they've narrowed down Maxwell and the access of Mapleton. So there are surface parking spots in that site, but they're not actually designated for the public. However, um, 
Oh, I, the, the upper space, they've now got 15 parking slots from the 32 that used to exist. I don't know why that is, probably to keep the public away. The have come out, this is the little positive thing. They've offered 20 parking slots near the existing medical building off 4th Street. So that's the a nice gesture that they may have moved in the right direction. So you all know about camp, and it looks to me like we need stamp. Uh, the data shows that Sanitas is slightly bigger in my calculations than Chautauqua. Also, the problems need county involvement. Is there really a serious open space parking problem for the future? That's the question. We need a verification measurement demonstration by closing the site off for a weekend and measuring it. Your opinion matters, and I would really like the board and members of Open Space Mountain Parks that are present today to go up one Saturday or Sunday mornings and determine for yourselves whether I'm talking nonsense or whether it's a very real problem. If you could take a little stroll up the Sunshine Canyon Trail and you look down on the Centennial parking lot, you'll see us a circulation of cars taking place all the time there. Further up, about half a mile up, there's parking for about another 20 cars. That is really dangerous. There's a lot of cars coming down there and it really needs to be addressed. Walk onto the, the Mapleton site and see the open space users parking on that site. So if you agree we have a potential problem, we can't afford time to wait for the open space master plan because that's only going to implement in 2020. Right now, we've got influence over the developers. We've, until that's approved, <coughs> we've got the chance of them giving us more parking. So I think we need to do that verification problem as fast as we can. And closing that off is the best method of getting really solid data. I think we need to start a trailhead study. I've talked to the uh, neighborhood parking people, and they were uh, looking at updating their parking plan for the Mapleton area, and they need to do it in conjunction with open space to come up with solutions which would be comparable with camp. So we need to get all the people together uh, and deal with the spirit of the public participation working group report. If you've got time, please put some level of input from May the 31st to the planning board. Thank you. Thanks, Alan. Uh, Nicholas Vinson, followed by Don Vinson. Hi there. Um, the board I want to, my name is Nick Vinson. And I'm at 4965 Koala Drive. That's where I'm living. Uh, and we were impacted in 2013 by the flood uh, by South Boulder Creek. Uh, and I just wanted to express my uh, appreciation for your continued support for the options uh, for flood mitigation. Um, very primal um, issue here is, is safety uh, for myself, my family, my friends, um, <coughs> and my neighbors. And so just wanted to express my concern and, and support for your guys' uh, work on on these options and time is of the essence. Uh, it's not a question of, of uh, if another flood's going to happen, it's, it's a question of when. So appreciate your timely efforts and looking forward to what you guys come up with. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. Don Vinson, followed by Hans Price. Good evening. My name is Don Vinson, obviously the father of Nicholas Vinson, and I'm here in reference to the topic he's discussing. And uh, actually, I don't live here, but I'm in process of moving here from a from a state that knows a little bit about storms. That's Florida, and uh, I've seen a lot of people come up here with different topics, very a lot of conviction, and and they've got a beautiful area here. It's just absolutely why I come, want to come out here, and I'm going to move out here. But I think it's it's not a matter of saving a flower or a tree or bush. It's, you're talking about the safety of human beings. And like uh, my son said, it's not a matter of when, if it's going to happen, it's when it's going to happen. 
So I appreciate any support in making this place safe as possible you can, the area. One thing I want to say is I saw a film uh, about, I think it's called the Fraser Meadows uh, Elderly Living Facility during the <coughs> 2013 flood. It was uh, horrific. I mean, uh, the, the, the power and the water coming through there, that's only maybe six or eight blocks where my son and daughter and soon to have uh, grandchildren are going to live in are living now. So I think it's important, all these other issues that come up, it's important to everybody, but this is a matter of human safety and I hope that the right thing is done. Thank you very much. Thank you, Don. Uh, Hans Price, followed by Matthew Bentley. Good evening, Hans Price, 1719 Mariposa Avenue. Um, it appears that tonight is Tracy Winfrey's last OSBT meeting, and I wanted to take the opportunity in the name of the Boulder Mountain Bike Alliance to thank you for your service as uh, the director of OSBT, OSMP, I'm sorry. Um, <clears throat> Under your leadership, we have seen a significant change to the organization. In particular, uh, <coughs> I'd like to mention uh, the openness uh, to uh, discuss issues and also um, uh, that, that we as the Boulder Mountain Bike Alliance feel accepted as legitimate trail users um, and a partner. Um, we now have a much greater opportunity to engage volunteers uh, to give back to the trails, to help build fun and sustainable trails. And um, yeah, so basically that is my message. I wanted to thank you um, and I hope you enjoy your retirement <laughs> and we're looking forward to, under the new leadership to continue this partnership um, uh, moving forward, so thank you. Thank you, thank you Hans. Uh, Matthew Bentley, followed by Daphne Kingsley. Hi, uh, my name is Matt Bentley. I own, a home, I own a home on Birchwood Drive. I'm an environmental engineer and a researcher at CU Boulder <coughs> in the Environmental Engineering Department. Um, after hearing about some of the difficulties that Mr. Husney um, has had through the OSMP land bidding process, I decided to review and compare some of the bids um, for the properties that he's pursued. So upon reviewing these bids, it's my professional opinion that Mr. Husney's proposals have been consistently superior in the area of environmental sustainability and conservation than the winning proposals. Mr. Husney's proposals have been far more detailed than the winning bids, as you've seen. Um, in many cases regarding environmental impacts and sustainability of farming practices, and as farming philosophies and values align with the stated goals of OSMP farm leasing program due to its uh, commitment to organic, diversified, sustainable growing practices, <coughs> uh, and provision of locally produced foods in the Boulder area, which are characteristics highly sought after here. Um, all of Mr. Husney's bid proposals have included commitments to organic growing practices without the use of pesticides, organic or synthetic, um, and the environmental impact of pesticide use is large and has the potential to affect human health, uh, most notably, in addition to the health of the surrounding ecosystem. Mr. Husney also proposes uh, the use of only natural manure fertilizers for use on any leased land from the livestock he currently manages or from other local livestock sources. This would significantly reduce agricultural environmental impacts as synthetic fertilizers have large impacts on greenhouse gas emissions um, and nutrient release to the environment. In each of Mr. Houston's bids, he strongly emphasizes his commitment and goals to improve biodiversity on his leased land, uh, which is among OSMP's stated goals, as well as the strategies to improve the long-term fertility of soil um, and health of his managed areas. And many winning bids uh, proposed using unspecified pesticides, as well as synthetic fertilizers to maximize crop production, and did not mention any strategies to maintain long-term soil health and biodiversity on the leased land. One winning proposal even included the use of a synthetic polymer uh, that contains a known human neurotoxin to reduce erosion, uh, where Mr. Husney's proposals have incorporated natural solutions to erosion, irrigation, and drainage. Further, Mr. Husney's bids have incorporated his philosophy of farming as utilizing and supporting the natural ecosystem to ensure long-term environmental sustainability <coughs> of the areas he manages. He has an extensive history, as you've heard, successfully implementing these practices on the land he currently manages in Boulder, as well as his work internationally in Zambia. 
After a cursory look at the environmental practices proposed in Mr. Husney's bids compared to those discussed in the winner's bids, the result seems to conflict with OSMP's commitment to their stated values of environmental preservation and ecological stewardship. Mr. Houston's farming philosophy has positive environmental impacts because of his long-term investment in soil fertility, uh, water quality, land management, and biodiversity. And his proposals deserve fair consideration due to their clear superiority in the area of environmental conservation and sustainability compared to the winners of those leased lands. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Uh, Daphne Kingsley, followed by Patricia Carden. Thanks, I'm actually gonna pass. Okay, thank you. Then Patricia Carden followed by Alexia Parks. Good evening. My name is Patricia Carden. I live at 350 Ponca Place in Boulder. I thank you for the masterful work, pun is intended, that you have done and you continue to do in creating a unique and comprehensive master plan for the citizens of Boulder. I am speaking tonight about my ongoing concern for the safety of South Boulder residents with respect to flood danger. That danger has been known and re remediation has been recommended even years before the devastating <coughs> 2013 flood. <coughs> Most of us living at Fraser Meadows Manor, sorry, participated in the arduous and effective master plan process and were so pleased with its approval last year. For as you know, we suffered major damage, displacement of residents, loss of cars, and very importantly, loss of housing, which has yet to be replaced. We're five years out, and that's not to be replaced for almost two more years. In reviewing the highlights of the draft focus areas, I find reference to preserving floodplains in the ecosystem health, mitigating flood risks in resilience to environmental changes, and then under the financial state sustainability, references to strategic acquisitions and prioritizing investments in time and money, which I think fit into flood protection, but it's not specific. So I am seeking that, I am speaking, asking for recognition that safety from flood danger is a priority for you. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia and Alexia. Hi there. Oops. Hi, I'm Alexia Parks. I live at 973 Fifth Street in Boulder. Um, and you may remember I was here last fall. I am founder of something called the Boulder Study Trails. The Boulder Study Trails uh, involved all schools in the Boulder Valley School District in an outdoor education uh, program that ran um, with the support of the Colorado Mountain Club and also um, with the support of the Boulder Valley Schools. We had all schools, at that time 24 schools, participating. And our focus was on the mountains. We brought everybody from uh, all those school districts via buses, and they came and we led them on tours on uh, six uh, to eight trails that were right against the base of the mountains in order to appreciate and understand the value of preserving and protecting outdoor education. The part of that is, um, I, there are statistics, we all know that, that today's youth spend 50% less time than their parents out of doors, and our, the, those parents probably spent less, 50% less than their parents, and the, the lack of um, engagement, the lack of um, bringing them into those parks um, could result, uh, if not converted, um, into a loss of stewardship. So my uh, 
brief comments today uh, regard to the Sanita Center. Now, Alan Delamere just showed a picture of the property. He urged you to take a walk around it, and I would also encourage you specifically, along with walking to that parking lot, and I'd be happy to go with you as well, I'm sure he will, um, to take a look and walk around the three-story nurse's dorm that is in incorporated with that open space land that you now own. And the building apparently uh, may or may not, I'm not sure if that designation is official yet or not, it may be in planning, uh, the uh, ability to keep that building if you're able to keep it. Um, up until now, the land that the um, the hospital uh, was on has always been nonprofit, whether it was for public use, whether it was Indian use, whether it was public <coughs> use. This is the first time that land has been uh, shifted to a private use for private development. But the historic nature, if you go up to that three-story nurses building and you look around, that location which stands apart and alone, apart from the academy's proposed remaining buildings there is equivalent in my mind and those who see it to the NCAR site. The view is spectacular of the Flatirons. The view is also spectacular of the entire Boulder Valley. And we proposed it for what I would call the Sanita Center. It would be a creating a vision of the next 50 years of education and civic engagement in the stewardship of open space. Think of it like a local Aspen Institute, this three-story building that which we could uh, potentially have through public-private partnership. Think of it as a local a Aspen Institute for civic engagement related to land stewardship and education. It can include, very briefly, co-working spaces for all the nonprofits, including everyone who was mentioned here and their interests, a restaurant with a spectacular view of the flat irons, which could also be a conference space, which would be community supported, uh, the co-working space could be GOCO uh, funding from the lottery money because it would be nonprofits. Uh, it could include lodging for short term like one month or longer stays in partnership with the academy and it include, in, could include a health spa in partnership with the health and fitness community. And in a sense, you're creating a vision of a whole uh, next 50 years, next 100 years that's of benefit to all the community and it does have the parking <laughs> that people could then go onto the trails as we did with the Boulder Study Trails. So I would encourage you and I'd be happy to go with you and I'm sure Alan and anyone else who would to show you that breathtaking view and the value of maintaining it, and it's still within our grasp. So I encourage you to hang on to it. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Alexia. And Chris Corba. How's it going? I'm Chris Corba. Um, I'm from Boulder. I live at 730 South 46th Street uh, in South Boulder. And uh, a lot of the topics that are touched on here you know, near and dear to my heart, um, and ag agriculture being one of them. Um, Boulder is definitely known for it. Uh, growing up, going to Fairview, uh, going to CU, and wanting to have access to food, and, and now where I'm at, trying to be interested in getting into what is it to be a producer um, in this town that I grew up in. Um, so I'm definitely wanting to uh, <laughs> thank everybody that's uh, spoke on that topic, and I think they've said enough about it, um, and or more could be said, but um, in looking at what another topic that we've been touched on is floods. Um, so we have the image of the Dust Bowl happening, we have flooding happening, we have uh, the South Boulder CU property being potentially developed, and the land and f the knowledge where you should not build has been here for long enough, um, except we continue to do that. So I think that it's fairly obvious to make connections uh, as to what's happening <coughs> as we're not actually, um, well, maybe we are, we are making the connection, but um, that drains are being clogged with the silt from the land that's being tilled. The tillage is not allow is, is done for monocropping, and then we have to apply all these pesticides and things to make that sustainable. Um, when, you know, it'd be great to see some regenerative agriculture project happen on these degraded lands, um, and as well as it could potentially be uh, in water storage that could help prevent flooding in these different areas. Um, and every time we have uh, buildings being built and surfaces being paved over, we're not, uh, we're, we're increasing that flood and the runoff. And if the drainage is blocked because the dust has filled up all of the drainage places, well, it's just going to get worse. The health and safety of people is going to continue to uh, be in jeopardy when we do have these major flood events, which are, we know <coughs> will happen again at some point. Um, so I just would like to make that connection between all of the things that have been talked about, including how can we have more local food um, and potentially <coughs> these 
elements that could pr be, provide safety uh, in the, the form of you know not allowing ground to be bare, storing and holding water for longer periods of time. So uh, the one uh, one great idea is instead of having run off, you have run on. So you're able to capture that water, slow it down, and not let it all hit the storm drains all at the same time and produce 2013. Uh, so thank you. Thank you, Chris. Okay, I think we'll close public participation and it's I guess I should first ask were you expecting um, the turnout on the agricultural leasing issue or um, we did find out today John perhaps you could come up John Potter I know has been um, oop. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Those are important. <laughs> um, John Potter has been uh, addressing this issue, so shall I just turn it over yeah, to you? Sure. Okay. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Tracy. Um, and uh, board John Potter, Resource and Stewardship Manager. And yeah, so uh, ag staff were here last month, as you recall, and we talked about the um, pr the bid rate uh, issue, which came out of the master plan, uh, out of the agricultural management plan, excuse me. And um, so as we're reviewing the lease rates, uh, we also realize that it gives us an opportunity to look at the entire process around um, selections for uh, lease <coughs> uh, open space lands. And so uh, I think there are some opportunities for continuous improvement there. So we'll be looking at things like transparency and um, open bidding and other issues that have been raised tonight, certainly good things for us to look at. Um, we have very dedicated, good agricultural staff, and they, they work very hard to try to meet the goals of the agricultural management plan. And um, I feel like we can, uh, we're always, there's always room to, to do better, but that's what we're going to be looking at. And before we put out any additional bids for any uh, lands, we're going to make sure we go through this effort to look at what we're doing and make sure it's we're doing it the right way. And um, so that's... Uh, expected to be in 2019 that we'll have a number of additional properties will go up for bid so we'll um ha have the opportunity to go through this process make sure we're in good alignment <coughs> policy that you approved in the agricultural management plan and um pr proceed from there so was it correct that we're uh osmp has a, a practice that we can only have one new lessee per year um no, not at all. That's um, probably a misunderstanding. The, there was in the agricultural management plan, you may recall, uh, a goal of uh, bringing on additional uh, local food uh, operations. Uh, those take, uh, so those in particular take a significant amount of investment and staff time to uh, to be able to uh, Take on a, a new a new um, local local food operation, particularly investments in infrastructure and other things. So sometimes we're limited in how many of those we could do in a possible year, and that might be where that um, that sense was. But certainly overall, we um, are you know the it could be multiple new bidders any any year, multiple new operators in any year. So. Because um, some of what we heard raised, you know, we hear a lot that there's, in a sense, a shortage of ranchers slash farmers and that we need to do more to make sure there's some continuity and that we're going to have people willing and able to farm these lands in the future. What we heard tonight, and I, I understand this is a part of a broader story, but nonetheless, we heard some people who had very specific and, uh, to my mind, you know, attention-getting things to say that put a somewhat different light on that about, well, maybe there's a somewhat larger pool of potential farmers out there, but maybe we're not doing, and I'm just reacting to what they're saying. I haven't heard, I don't pretend to have heard fully both sides here, but it raises a question as to whether we need to do more to be tapping into that pool and to make sure that if there's a shortage, it's not of our own creation by not sort of reaching out to others. But I um, certainly welcome your you know, perspective on that, but it was something that I caught that seemed a little different from what we had been hearing. Yeah, uh, I, I think that probably we'll, we'll see over as... Um, as some long-term tenants start to turn over, we'll see uh, a lot of additional opportunities for that to, to occur and um, for us to be considering 
uh, different type, different approaches on on lands. The, you know, water is a big issue, and uh, we we need to make sure that uh, there's there's adequate water to do the types of operations that folks want to do. It isn't always possible <coughs> every acre of of rangeland that's out there. So. Um, you know, I feel the staff do a good job in taking that into consideration and really thinking through what opportunities might be available. But like I say, we can always um, look for ways to do continuous improvement and do better on, on making opportunities available. So that's that will be our goal and what we'll, we'll try to do uh, moving forward. Um, any well, I'll just follow up. Uh, do you have a sense when you might be ready to come back uh, having done your analysis and give us a report on proposed changes to the process? Um, yeah, most likely given the ex the current work plan that we have, that that would be probably, that could be sometime in the fall or uh, early winter before we put any additional bids out um, to the public. So. Your request for proposals normally go out, what, January? Yeah, in the end of, towards the end of the year, early okay. into the new year, so that folks have a chance to get set up before the season starts. So. Okay. Um, I mean, I'd, I'd mirror kind of what Kurt said. Um, it would be nice to have some clarity on this. Sure. Uh, from my perspective sitting here, I think I heard one side of the story that was very, very compelling tonight. As a person who part of my job is avail evaluating landscapes based on concrete metrics, um, to not make those publicly available, nor the results of those publicly available given public land, s to me, just as a knee-jerk, sounds like a really bad idea. And as a manager, you'd probably get better bidding if you had complete transparency because everyone knows what metrics you're using to evaluate the landscape. Now, I heard one side of this story tonight. I'd really like to hear the other side from you guys about how you're dealing with it already and what your plans are for the future so that anybody, whether it's Andre or someone else, can come in and say, I met these criteria, I got an 8.5 and this person got a 6.5, I'm going to sue. And then that would make sense. Or I got an 8.5 and they got a 9.5 and I lost and therefore I can't sue or whatever it is. Um, I think that that kind of transparency is just really vital for a public process. Um, and I know that it's not easy, but I'm just saying it would be really helpful for me and I think for everyone to just say, here's the rules um, and here's how we chose it. And my understanding, John, is that the, you and the staff will be assessing the, the process, um, reviewing the process, looking for continuous improvement before the next round of leases go out and we have a number of opportunities coming up. And yep, that's one, correct. Okay. One more thing I would add to that is that I recognize you have different criteria that will prioritize different things, right? So one, you might place a higher prioritization on local food production. Another one, you might produce pr higher prioritization on less water use. Uh, I think that would be really a, um, helpful to have that explicitly stated so that anyone interested in leasing would know what the city's prioritizations are um, because that way they'll know you know, what we're valuing. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, um, th <coughs> those are great points and really appreciate it to, to hear your views on that. So. Yeah. yeah. And um, I just wanted to add to those who came and uh, spoke uh, to speak to us tonight, um, just by the way, I've spent a large portion of my professional life dealing with the economics of agricultural bid markets. Um, it's actually sort of what I do for I'm a sorry. living. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, it's all good. Um, and I would hope, uh, I, I get the sense this, from your perspective, has been an issue that's been festering for quite some time, can't change the past, but I, you know, want you to understand that we meet every month and are open to, at any time between now and when you hear, we hear back from staff, um, to please feel welcome to come and express yourselves as obviously a well thought out um, presentation by a number of people, yeah. and um, you have our attention. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you. And thanks, John. Thank you. <clears throat> so, um, can I, yeah. can I just offer a couple of other sure. updates? Um, <coughs> just items that came up during the um, public comment. One is uh, the Prairie Dog Working Group. The Prairie Dog issue came mm -hmm. up. The Prairie Dog Working Group does continue to meet. 
uh, and their next meeting, they're, I don't know if it's been finalized, but they're looking at early June for their next meeting, and those meetings do take public comment. Is that correct, Carrie? So encouraging people to um, offer public comment at those meetings. And that, that will be on the Prairie Dog uh, website, is that right? Prairie Dog Working Group website. Okay, great. Um, South Boulder Creek was raised also a number of times, and um, the South Boulder Creek flood mitigation process continues. And um, my understanding from staff is that they're um, looking for a joint meeting slash public hearing um, at the next RAB meeting and inviting the Open Space Board of Trustees to attend that meeting, and it is June 18th is the date of that meeting. So um, the idea is that to have a, a public hearing before bo both boards would be efficient for the boards and for the public. Uh, then um, it would be clarified what is of open space boards purview and then what is of the water resources advisory board purview and then you would go off to your um, next board meetings uh, for you would be your july board meeting you would have an additional <coughs> public hearing and then take action on the open space aspects of the south boulder creek flood mitigation um, then a follow-up item on 311 mapleton uh, you have you gave as p one of your three motions. I think you took three motions on the 311 Mapleton project, and um, one of those motions had to do with uh, advice to the planning board. Uh, the planning board will be hearing the 311 Mapleton project at their May 31st meeting, I believe, and then it goes on to city council on June 19th. There will be a public hearing at. Um, city Council that evening. So just to give you a sense of how things are rolling along in, on those various topics. <coughs> oh, and I actually have a couple other verbal updates, if that's okay. Um, one is that uh, there were two acquisitions. Um, did you want to have, did you have any other comments around um, the public hearing in particular? I, I did not. Nope. Okay. No, thank you. Um, there were two acquisitions that went forward to City Council, which they approved uh, at their, um, I can't remember which council meeting it was, it, not last council meeting, but the council meeting before <coughs> actually Tom Isaacson was in attendance because some questions were coming up just before the council meeting. Uh, and uh, while the council approved the two acquisitions, particularly on the poor farm acquisition, um, we heard, relatively significant caution around taking on additional um, structures, additional buildings, uh, and the cost impact of that, the liability of that. Um, so we heard caution about that, and th that was really relative to the, f the farmhouse, the old Victorian on the farm um, property there, on the poor farm property. And then uh, it also came up that there was caution about the Ag Center concept. And again, sort of more bricks and mortar, um, more uh, facility um, costs and concerns, especially with the sunsetting sales taxes that we're facing. So I thought I would share that back with the board. <coughs> we heard that pretty, um, it was a pretty significant conversation, uh, one that we weren't really expecting at council. And I don't know, Tom, if you would want to share anything else. No, I think there were, in general, there was a concern about, you know, how much money we have invested in housing and taking on additional housing and sort of the, the bigger picture, an issue that, you know, if it possibly becomes uh, something in the master plan, but something that was a much more bigger picture concern. And then there were a number of concerns specific to that property. Um, I would say there was a, a very wide, an unusually wide range of opinions from this house is an albatross that you're gonna regret to this is awesome and there are at least five wonderful things we could do about it, do with it, excuse me. And um, uh, I think, it was widely understood that, well, that wasn't the immediate 
decision at hand was just an acquisition decision. There weren't any sort of follow-on disposal issues before us, before the council, <coughs> um, but that um, I think they were both seen as opportunities and threats around this property, and it's one that, you know, it's probably like Boulder Valley Farms, it's going to make some sense to have a little bit of, and, you know, some right. process on what are we going to do with this property. And Tom made the very good point to council that we off, we don't often get an a la carte choice, <laughs> that you don't get to pick and choose from a property w what to purchase. And so clearly what, what the staff will do is an assessment of the property over the next couple of years and determine what is truly of an open space purpose uh, and, um, you know, would continue to ride with the property and what other decisions might be made to, say, um, split off a, a house or two and, and put it up for sale. Um, one other quick thing for me, um, <coughs> that uh, council is considering a variety of uh, ballot items. Um, one th um, one item that they're looking at is the potential of extending the moratorium for oil and gas exploration, uh, and they'll be talking about that at their May 15th meeting. Um, and it's really uh, the city attorney's office is, is in the lead on that particular item. And then we have already had the GOAB presentation, so the next item uh, from matters from the department is the draft capital improvement program. Hi there, Lauren Kilcoyne here to talk about the 2019 to 2024 Capital Improvement Program, or CIP. And this is our second touch on the 2019 to 2024 CIP. Last month when we were here, um, we stuck to a pretty high level work plan overview and talked about our budget guiding principles and draft department priorities for next year. Um, for this month, you actually have some, some recommended uh, CIP funding, uh, funding across uh, various projects, maintenance, enhancement, acquisition, et cetera. Um, when we come back next month, it will be for a public hearing discussion and recommendation. And after that, for July and August, we'll shift to, to talking about our operating budget. And the purpose of tonight's presentation, we want to make sure that we follow up on some of your questions from last month, uh, reiterate the goal of this particular May business meeting, uh, give you another update on the citywide economic forecast, as well as OSMP's reaction <coughs> to that forecast and what our plan is moving forward. Um, bring up a couple highlights and refinements to show kind of how our thinking has changed on a, a couple projects from last year's process and then provide time for any questions you might have. And one of the, the big themes of last month was really defining the scope of the budget process as compared with the master plan. We had a lot of conversation about trends and trade-offs and um, using information that we're collecting through engagement windows to tell stories and make decisions moving forward. So staff took all of your questions from last month and went through them and made a recommendation on whether, whether we think those are appropriate for the budget process or the master plan, oftentimes both at different scales. But what we feel is within the scope of the current budget process is certainly understanding the revenue changes and budget challenges that we're going through now and will be going through over the next couple of years and explaining how we're adapting to those challenges. We also want to provide some trend data to give perspective on the work accomplished. And we heard from you all that 2012 is of particular importance, going back to 2012 whenever we can, so that we're not just focusing on what happened during the flood and we're providing some baseline data from before the flood occurred. And then where possible, we want to provide graphics and tables to share how we take care of what we have um, We'll have a lot that's generated in terms of uh, visual displays of our data through the master plan process, and so our focus moving forward in this, this presentation and the next three will be uh, graphic displays of data um, where that data currently exists. So generating new stuff, keep it for the master plan, but certainly providing as much data as we have currently um, to get us through this budget process. And then as for what's within the scope of the master plan and out of the budget scope, um, we really feel like presenting a range of options as we move forward towards stewardship and telling the story of how shifting priorities will manifest in the budget are more appropriate for the master plan process. We want to make sure that we're using this, uh, this time while we do the master plan 
to listen to the community and understand what they want from us in terms of priorities over the next 10 years. And certainly once the plan is approved, all future bud budgets would reflect the, the needs of the community and, and plan recommendations. Um, and again, just creating and providing a wider range of graphics and tables to share will come through the, the budget, uh, through the master plan process rather. And so the focus for tonight's meeting is really based on current knowledge, so our organizational assessment and other assessments we've completed and recommendations from our plans. Based on everything we know right now, do we have the right balance across our capital budgets in the 2019 to 2024 CIP? And of course the master plan um, will be approved during that six year horizon. And although we look at a six year horizon, we approve a budget each year. And so of particular importance is, do we have the right balance in 2019 across these projects while we await the, the completion of the master plan? And this is not new information, uh, but to, to just give you an update on the economic <coughs> forecast, we are experiencing flattening revenues from retail sales tax across the city. OSMP is particularly affected by that given the sales tax structure of the open space fund and some scheduled changes over the next couple of years. We did receive a couple weeks ago our initial 2019 revenue projections from the finance department, and they came in pretty much as we expected. We were anticipating a no growth scenario for the next couple of years and then returning to a slow growth sales and use tax assumption uh, between one and 2% in those out years of the, the planning horizon. And our draft CIP was certainly created with a no growth scenario in mind, so we feel pretty confident there, and our operating budget will, will also reflect that financial reality. And just a note that we continue to get information from the finance department several times a week at this point in the year. And as we receive information, we make some changes and, and adjustments to our CIP and operating budgets. And so we'll continue to bring those forward as we get more information in from our partners. So uh, one of the things you asked for was trend data. And I know um, the sales tax increments will be expiring in the next two years, but just to give you a picture of where we've been, for the last six, seven years, we've really been seeing slow economic growth um, across um, the city and the, affecting the open space fund. And you'll notice on the, the chart in 20, starting in 2016, continuing through this year, those lines between the sales and use tax collection and our overall revenues start to separate a little bit more. And I just want to explain briefly why that was. Um, we have been, as we complete our FEMA reimbursable flood projects, writing our scope changes and submitting requests for reimbursement. And so um, you'll see our fund financial last month that breaks out our revenues, but one of those revenue lines is our anticipated FEMA reimbursement dollars from the projects. So that's important because those are one-time dollars. Mm -hmm. And we want to make sure that as we're receiving those one-time dollars that we're using them for one-time purposes and not relying on them to, to be a stopgap or to get us through the, the upcoming changes. And then shifting to the next six years, uh, one of the questions from last month was how many millions are we talking about here? Uh, we, we see the sales tax increments, but it's hard to understand what that means in terms of real dollars. And so you can see in 2018, we're anticipating about 30 million in sales and use tax revenue to the open space fund, which goes down to 21 to 22 million um, over the next two years. And so that's an eight or nine million difference. And again, returning to slow growth, but that will have an impact. And, and luckily, because we knew sales taxes were expiring, um, we've been preparing for this for a really long time. And so certainly there's an added intensity in the flattening sales tax revenues, but um, I'll talk about process improvements in a little while and how we've been preparing for that for several years. One of the questions that you asked was, um, how do we tell the story about how we're adapting to budget challenges? And these are some sort of straightforward ways, and then I'll get into the, the more subjective after that. But a few years ago, we said, you know, we're, we're really sales tax dependent, more so than other funds across the city, and it's important for us to have <coughs> strong reserves. So we increased our reserves to 20% of operating in debt. Um, you heard some comments tonight, it's not a matter of if, uh, but when, and so we want to make sure that in the case of another disaster that we're prepared and we have dollars set aside um, to support resilience uh, for across the system um, and across the city. We also want to utilize our fund balance to support gradual changes to our business practices instead of immediate changes because of the change of our sales tax structure. And so. Typically, and again, you'll have your fund financial next month, but typically at the end of that six year horizon, after all of your revenues, your expenses and your reserves, you have one to $2 million remaining in your fund balance. We actually have $30 million in our fund balance right now, which again was planned. We knew things would be changing and we wanted to be especially conservative and prepared as we headed into some changing times. And so 
what this allows us to do, um, the 2019 budget, you'll still see that your annual expenditures are within your annual revenues, but there are a couple years there where it will be very challenging to keep your annual expenditures within your revenues at the same time as your sales tax shifts and your sales tax flatten. And so those dollars allow us a little bit of time to adjust gradually um, to make sure that we're still maintaining high levels of customer service and carrying out all of our programs. And then by 2023, our expenditures are back within annual revenues. And so I feel much better about that, knowing that at least three of those six years, and in particular, the final two years of that six year horizon um, look uh, very good. Um, we mentioned last month that we'll be making final payments on our 06 and 07 bond issues. And finally, we want to make sure as we consider budget reductions through 2019 that we're showing balance across all of our functions and expenditure types. It's very easy to say when times are tough to, that we should cut CIP, but we've made commitments and these are important community investments, particularly this maintenance backlog that we keep discussing um, that's accumulated while we've recovered from the flood. And so it's important to uh, be consistent in how you're approaching those reductions across all of those types. And then talking about process improvements and business efficiencies, again, we've known this has been coming for a number of years with the added layer of the flattening sales tax, and we've um, had some years-long efforts that we're actually starting to realize the, the benefits from right now, and we'll continue to make uh, process improvements over the next six years and beyond to make sure, again, it's part of a continuous improvement ethic. We always want to be getting better at what we do. But a couple examples um, that we feel are a benefit for the customer and a benefit for us in terms of budget and staff time are um, some of the online systems that we've gone live with this year. So one of those is online sales of annual parking permits. Sounds like a small thing. It took several years to be able to do that. And now um, customers can purchase their annual, their annual parking permits from wherever they want. <laughs> Certainly are still welcome to come in and work with our staff at the, at the front desk. But it saves them time. It saves us time and money. Um, and it's really a, a net win. And same, same goes for our, our facilities reservation systems and our commercial and special use permitting systems. That in particular took five years. And we're finally live with it as of next month. And so you can see that. We've been planning for this for a very long time. There are changes going into effect that will allow us to, um, to face this changing forecast in a really <coughs> way. We also want to learn from the flood and from all of these assessments that we've completed, um, uh, particularly around how we estimate costs, uh, how we phase out our projects and our overall project timelines. The facilities assessment is a great example of that from last year, where that assessment tells us exactly what we have in deferred maintenance each year for the next 10 years, and that helps us program our CIP and build our work plan for that work group. Um, that's happening in a number of ways on a number of scales across the department. And we'll continue to improve our work planning efforts with a focus on stewardship and taking care of what we have, ensuring that the base of our work plan is plan implementation, and that we're showing balance across all of our functions and services and charter purposes. So looking at the, the overall CIP before we break it down into um, CIP category or individual project, we want to show um, that the 2019 CIP that you see in front of you is really a return to pre-flood CIP levels. And it's easy to say, wow, is it, because of the, is it because of the revenue projections that your CIP is decreasing? Well, no, not really. And 2012 <laughs> and 2013 data shows that really, on average, we were spending between four and six million a year in the open space CIP. It's only because we were simultaneously implementing North TSA, West TSA, and flood recovery that that, that spike occurred. And so this is our opportunity to establish reasonable work plans, return to an appropriate CIP. And as we break that down across categories, um, we invest in capital enhancement, maintenance, planning, new facility infrastructure, and of course, acquisition. We keep talking about this shift to stewardship. And what does that mean? And how can we back that up through the budget? And one of the ways we do that is by increasing our investment in capital maintenance as compared to other CIP categories. And you can see over the last few years the, the, the emphasis on enhancement, and you can see kind of over the last three years that gradual shift and that gradual uptick in maintenance, and we would expect that to continue over the six-year horizon. And that certainly has an impact on our acquisition funding. And you know, historically, our acquisition has been the majority of our CIP, and from 2012, it was around 3.7 million, jumped up to 5.7 million. 
Um, but as part of that story, as part of the taking care of what we have, you'll see a, a gradual decrease in annual acquisition funding as compared to other categories. <coughs> and a big part of that story is our capital carryover, and this was a focus of last year's budget process and will continue to be. So um, to back up a little bit, in 2014, we had a general obliga uh, obligation bond issue for $10 million. Our goal was to spend that within three years. We successfully spent the $10 million at the end of, uh, by the end of last year. But while we were focusing on spending that $10 million, we continued to fund the acquisition CIP at $5.7 million or somewhere around there. And those dollars carried. And we've accrued this capital acquisition um, uh, category that even after we actually pay for all of the approved properties that have already come to you into council, we have $7 million in carryover remaining, and that's before you factor in the next six years of funding. So as you see this draft CIP, um, the funding amounts will not affect any current negotiations, and again, it, it follows our plan to gradually de decrease acquisition and to focus on system stewardship. And lastly, um, just wanted to, to highlight a few projects that we've had in our CIP before, but that have been recast through this budget process. Regional collaboration used to be regional trails. We created that CIP uh, project last year, and we wanted to recast it to reflect the broader work that we're doing with our partners. Um, and, and our deputy director, Steve, represents OSMP on a regional roundtable, and they're certainly talking about trail feasibility studies, but also things like trail courtesy messaging and how do, how do users be responsible in the system to minimize impacts and so it's really a much broader topic than just trails and we wanted to reflect that regarding the long-term campus vision last year that was categorized as capital acquisition we did not know at that time if we would need to purchase additional land for our future space we've since shifted our focus to redeveloping the Cherryvale location and so in this CIP you'll see that reflected as a capital enhancement funded at hundred thousand dollars and that is strictly to support a feasibility study to make sure there are no fatal flaws <coughs> in the Cherryvale um, idea and we know that the feasibility study will help us better project out the cost for the long-term campus vision and finally new property stabilization was also uh, previously under capital acquisition but has been recategorized as capital maintenance and what that allows us to do similar to how we're funding um, all the other maintenance categories it allows us to get back to that maintenance backlog that we've been unable to address while we've been focusing on flood recovery and the expectation across all of those capital maintenance categories is that they're used interchangeably and certainly there are parts of new property stabilization for example that support work on agricultural items and so folks managing the agricultural CIP should and will use both of those capital maintenance buckets to, to accomplish their work. Um, so really those are the those are the major changes. We've got some questions here um, just ensuring that this um, CIP um, reflects your your interest and understanding of where we should be for 2019 and if you have any questions um, I will certainly try to answer them now or get you answers after. Sure. He has his hand up. I just have a quick question that I wrote down. Um, since next year's um, capital maintenance is like, uh, I'm not sure how you spell that, Leah, if you're <laughs> the notes. Um, but uh, I was just wondering if you could better define all that's going to be wrapped into that in, next, in just next year and, and like what's going on because that's just so much more money. Yeah, and a lot of it gets to, um, since last year's CIP, we've completed our trails condition assessment, um, the facilities assessment, and um, the ag plan was approved. And so we start to take the, the top priorities of all of those things and put them together and craft a work plan that we feel is as appropriate as we can. Um, so you start to see all of those things show up. So regarding trails condition, we would look at those things that are classified as in poor condition and put those towards the top of our work plan before potentially addressing things that are in good condition. Um, agricultural management plan certainly had a number of recommendations, but that staff has worked to say, okay, what can we, what can we get started on now in terms of replacing infrastructure um, while we continue to figure out some of the other uh, recommendations from that plan. So. It really, um, I cannot overemphasize how much of our work plan has been dictated by the flood across every work group. And so this is our, this is our first chance to say, okay, what does our work plan look like after the flood? And there, the, the list of maintenance projects that came along with that question um, was pretty unbelievable. And so we have a new work plan system, a new software, where staff were able to enter all of those things, get weighted scores, and that's how we made those, those funding decisions. And there might be other things you wanna to add to that. Mm -hmm. 
Well, just the fact that uh, moving over the new property stabilization bucket into capital maintenance also increased that amount as compared to previous years when it was not part of that bucket. Makes but sense. doing work on properties we already own, which is new property stabilization, made sense to cast it in the uh, in the light of property ma or, or maintenance. And so follow up based on that, I'm guessing that in order to do this process, you need to uh, essentially budget these projects. Do you have a sense based on looking into the future, when's the backlog end? It's a good question, and it, it probably depends on the, the type of resource, um, the answer to that. But I know um, trails, that's a question that we've been getting on trails. So at what point are we caught up? And actually, we're within a few weeks, I think, of being able to, to have a, a clear timeline on that. But it, it certainly varies by, by type and then by how many things. The other thing that's worth mentioning, as we were completing flood recovery, because so much of the damage was in the, the geographic area of the West TSA, those things were done simultaneously. And so it's it's inventorying those rec those <coughs> items that were not done concurrent with the flood and, and getting back to those. And if I could just highlight one other thing, habitat restoration is a part of this, how we take care of the system, part of the maintenance. So that's also one of the categories. And oftentimes, if there's, a, in addition to that, um, trails, trail projects would come with restoration work. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. I think I would, I would probably add that many of the ecological uh, flood recovery projects were not FEMA reimbursable, and so yes. you didn't often hear about them here. Um, but just last year, I believe we spent $3 million on, on restoration projects that were not FEMA reimbursable, in, including the, the Boulder Creek, South Boulder Creek confluence area. So um, the same applies across all of those categories. I had a few, uh, uh, one comment and a few questions. Um, on uh, the very first page, um, and this is where you're allocating various topics to the budget versus the master plan or both, the, the first one, telling the story of revenue changes and budget challenges, which is assigned to the budget, this may just be a detail, and so, but I just want to be clear, I think it is important for the master plan to have that context. <coughs> um, it may be at a, different level of detail, and maybe that's what you, given the, um, maybe that's all that you meant, but I just want to make sure we're not, um, okay. Yeah, um, great, thank you. Let's see. On yes, you're correct. Okay. It will, yeah. It's also <laughs> informing the master plan, but we're not neglecting it in the budget process. So, and then the 1.6 million in real estate acquisition funding for 2019 is without whatever is left in the carryover. Exactly. This is just, okay, that's always just new funding. And throughout, this assumes, <coughs> I think, that there's no substantial activity on an East TSA that generates capital needs during the, the time horizon through 2024. Yes. Uh, if you may know this, but the, the visitor master plan in 2005 contemplated that all TSAs would be done in five years, and that that, that happened exactly that way. Right? <laughs> no, it's not going to happen in 20. <laughs> Maybe it meant each one. <laughs> <laughs> no, sadly. Um, I, on the uh, major infrastructure maintenance, this is one that really noticeably declines from 2019 to 2020, from 990,000 to 300,000. Um, and it looked to me like the poor farm stabilization is not in that, that's in the next bucket, that's in the stabilization bucket. So I'm curious what is in the, the major infrastructure maintenance bucket that's so prominent in 19, but drops way off in 2020. Yeah, that's great. Um, in the major infrastructure, it's primarily trails and trailheads and visitor amenities. So the 990 figure for next year includes um, an increase in the, the youth cores that we work for and the others that are work with and the other service cores to help us address some of that backlog in addition to our temporary and standard staff. And so you'll see in, um, like Mile High Youth Corps and Ready to Work and Bridge House, a number of other partners, um, we'll be able to work with them in, an, in an, uh, a greater way next year. Yeah, I, I, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't have, what is the 2018 number, the, the current year number for that? I believe it's 160, around 160. And all of the FEMA funding um, is funded separately. And so they're finishing up, Foothill South as an example, they're finishing up those flood recovery projects with nominal funding for non-flood this year. 
Or does that, it sound from the dollars at least, that's a huge increase from 160 to 990, then dropping back down to three. But is a commensurate change in personnel, or does this partly have to do with reallocating some dollars across different categories? Primarily reallocating dollars, you, uh, we'll be looking at um, in that in that particular work group a base staffing um, level in 2019, no significant <coughs> changes, but that is about uh, 30 temporary employees every year <coughs> who are doing that work. I, I mean, I had one question that it seems to have come up uh, quite a bit recently, just dealing with um, the issues of mineral rights and that. Um, there's been a lot of public concern about the fact that we own a lot of property but not the underlying mineral rights. Right. And I see that we have $100,000 as the allocated budget, which sounds like maybe that could buy some minerals, but probably not all that many given what's out there. And I was just wondering if you had any way of putting that into perspective for us given the you know, millions of dollars worth of outright property acquisition that's budgeted? Yeah, we're doing a, a really thorough in-depth analysis right now of all the mineral rights that we own, uh, those properties where we own fractional <laughs> mineral rights, and those properties in which we own none of the mineral rights. And uh, we expect to have that analysis wrapped up really soon, but we're starting to get some preliminary uh, information to kind of provide you with a scope of the issue in front of us in terms of mineral rights. So we do carry over uh, uh, mineral CIP monies that aren't used, and so we have about $785,000, including carryover and current year CIP budgeted towards mineral rights acquisition. The other thing that we've done between the land acquisition uh, CIP, the mineral, and the water is that if one fund is short and we want to do a priority acquisition is we could use funds from those three. So if we have a big mineral rights acquisition project that we want to pursue, but that CIP is a little short, we could take that from the land acquisition CIP to cover that. But getting back to your um, main point, the $785,000, while a good start, uh, would be uh, a little dent uh, towards the uh, uh, progress if the goal was to acquire almost <coughs> all the mineral rights that we could. So what we're doing is we're actually uh, going to be doing analysis of where the highest priority is to do that acquisition. And uh, so we've undertaken a study to determine where the uh, greatest potential for uh, mineral uh, development would be, and we would be overlaying that with where uh, we're short on the mineral rights acquisition, and out of that starting to kind of hone in on where that priority acquisition zone would be, and then to do an analysis is do we have some low-hanging fruit here within that priority area, uh, because uh, mineral rights acquisitions could be a very complicated thing, because if, if it's a split estate, it could be owned by multiple entities, and you're talking about a very complicated situation there. But we could have some uh, situations where acquisitions could make sense. It could be pretty straightforward, and we could have funding available <coughs> to do it. So those are the type of things that we're looking at right now to kind of come to some conclusions on on, on what kind of uh, ability do we have right now to, to uh, do some greater protection out there in our system. Yeah. I, oh, I was going to um, uh, comment or two. Uh, one is that I th my impression was, but please correct me if I'm wrong, that the 100,000, which has I think been a stable number for quite a few years, <coughs> was essentially what we thought we would need to buy the mineral rights on new acquisitions. And, uh, you know, in my, I th as long as I've been on this board, I think we have uh, acquired the mineral rights on maybe all, but maybe Ertl was an exception, but generally we've been able to buy the mineral rights on acquisitions going forward. Um, but I think what you're describing is looking at things where we previously didn't buy the mineral rights and where it wasn't available to us <laughs> at the and purchase time. Right, and I could also say that over the last few years, we've been using our land acquisition CIP to acquire all the rights, and in fact, including our water rights too. We haven't been dipping into the water rights CIP. We've just using our land acquisition CIP to do the acquisition of the land, the water, and the minerals, because we are expecting that we could use, see some priority water rights acquisitions that are needed and wanted to maintain that uh, CIP uh, funds available for separate purchases of water outside of when we acquire the property itself. And I'm assuming uh, but, um, that the fact that we're a municipality doesn't exempt us from state laws on statutory or sometimes called forced pooling, that just because you own the mineral rights doesn't mean that 
you're immune from your neighbor drilling under you. That's correct. I don't think we, we get around that problem. Yeah, that's it's 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 one it's an educational issue. I think we all you know need to understand better the public and and and, and otherwise is that uh, acquiring all the mineral rights certainly helps protect the surface of the land, but it doesn't guarantee that the minerals underneath those lands could be extracted through forced pooling or uh, or such. So it does offer greater surface rights protection when you own those uh, all the bundle of mineral rights, but it doesn't guarantee that the mineral rights underneath couldn't be extracted through the forced pooling type of situation. And I just had one more question. On page 15 on the uh, <coughs> campus vision, there's um, 2.5 million for 2018, and then it drops to 100,000. Um, I, I gather, is the 100,000, that can't be the rent for the new space. It's uh, probably <laughs> higher than that. That's a great question. Um, I'm trying to figure out which something's moving from one bucket to another. Yeah, and actually that 2.5 million addressed the interim space. And so uh, the way we phased out this project, the last couple of years of funding have supported the move to the interim location, um, including renovations, et cetera, that were needed to get us into that space in a couple of months. And um, that 100,000 is, is simply for the feasibility study. We got some feedback last year um, during the city council study session that our lease payment should move into our operating budget Budget, which is at, very accurate. Um, at the time of the budget, we didn't know yet what our location was going to be, and so that was reflected in the CIP. It has since moved out, and it'll be reflected in the operating budget. Okay. Hmm. I had a follow-up question for Dan. Uh, I know staff's been working assiduously on the issue of uh, mineral rights, and it's an extremely complicated <coughs> issue. Um, we've certainly seen a lot of comment on this issue or concern about this issue during the master plan. Uh, public uh, input processes um, and I know that some aspects of what you're doing probably are, are a lot like our acquisitions analysis we wouldn't make it public but I think it would be good if you're able to prepare some sort of report mm -hmm. in the next few months mm -hmm. three months uh, that gives the public some sense at a broad scale Yes. about where we stand and what our risks are. And it also helps the public better uh, interpret the amount of money we're putting towards this and things like that. So as you've said, there's a lot of education to happen here. And so uh, this is a challenging subject to address. But I think the sooner we do something, the better. Yep. And we are wrapping up. And Bethany Collins, our property agent, is leading the effort on that research going back all the way to patent yeah. about whether or not we truly own what we don't own. And and uh, we are expecting that uh, analysis to be wrapped up in, a, in the next few weeks. And we would love to come back to the board and re, re give you some summary reports of, uh, of what we're finding. Well, I think that would be great and with an eye towards some s packages that maybe we can import into the master plan process too that at least help educate the public about this process. I think great. Great. We'll Thanks. do that. I just have one sort of follow-up question that's actually one level above CIP since I've got you here. Um, I know there's all, we're discussing that the tax is going to run out and I just wondered if that's like, well, the tax is going to run and then it's done, or like, well, and then we just pass another tax, or then we try to pass another tax. Um, seems like you're budgeting for not another tax. Is there a mindset behind any of this that could be made of avail to us tonight or anything? I think that's really for the master plan process. You know, the, okay. the budget is for reasonably expected revenues and just, revenues yeah. that are approved by the voters. Yeah. Totally. I just didn't know okay. what, what was in the thinking, which that makes perfect sense. To yeah. Me. And the master plan will have fiscally constrained action and vision plans and depending on, <coughs> um, you know, community interest, et cetera, that that would be the time. Okay. Perfect. Thanks. Just uh, a few thoughts, uh, and I really appreciate what staff has done to try to address uh, some of our vague questions and <laughs> <laughs> them into unvague statements, so I really do appreciate it. I, uh, as always, I think there's more that we can do to create sort of our elevator speeches uh, or answers to the public if they say, how are you going to replace the nine million? And so. I think you've done a really good job of showing how our revenue is expected to change over time. One thing that didn't jump out at me, but maybe Tom found it, and that is, <laughs> what's our, what's our long-term target? What do we think our equilibrium target is? 
for annual <coughs> expenditures. And I think it, that discussion gets complicated because you have, uh, with a lot of foresight, created a lot of uh, rainy day funds and other contingency funds. And so it's not always easy to see when those come into play and they cushion the landing, as you say. Uh, and so trying to tease out in each year how much of our expenditures are based on our income that year versus our carryover funds, that gets a little complicated. Mm -hmm. But I think it would be helpful if you could try to be a little bit more upfront to say, uh, based on our reasonably expected revenues, which is the right way to do it, here's what we're targeting as our long-term expenditure rate. Uh, but in the meantime, we're going to use these other funds to try to cushion the landing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I think you've made great progress on that. Um, whatever more you can do to help us understand would be great. Um, another thing, and this gets to a, a point that uh, Kevin was making about um, seeing the changes and what we're going to invest in next year. Uh, I'm wondering if we ought to try to do some crosswalks. You folks uh, are always thinking hard about what pot different money should be put in. Uh, from an accounting perspective, and I think it makes sense. But, for example, it may be difficult now for folks that wonder, well, what are we putting into the uh, North TSA implementation to find that because it's been moved around a bit. And so I'm th wondering if for high visibility projects, that would be th for things the public has been heavily involved in, might we do a crosswalk that says, here's what we're spending on this implementation this year, this year, this year, and it could be found in one spot. Just something to think about. Uh, another, um, and, and maybe you answered this when you were answering Tom. Um, you talked, and this is on page uh, seven. You're talking about our property acquisition bonds and that we've got an additional 23 million. My uh, reading of that paragraph is that uh, priority acquisition is adequately funded by carryover in the coming years without using any of the additional $23 million in bonding authority. And I think that's, that's what you're saying. Yes. Maybe just state it outright, Great. because I, I do think it's a question that people come up with. And I think I'll stop there, because I don't know anymore. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, i just like to mention the staff's done just a terrific job since meeting with you last month, really listening to your input and um, capturing it and sorting it and being able to, you know, really do a nice job of providing some graphics that help tell the story that we heard about last time and to provide additional information, really Im improving year after year the transparency of the budget. And, and, you know, the feedback that we're receiving, it's, it just continues to be helpful. Um, really big kudos to the staff, though. They did a big lift um, between the last meeting and this meeting. And that's in addition to everything that goes into the budget office. <laughs> and, yeah, thank you, Lauren, so much. Lauren is not replaceable, <laughs> um, if anyone's noticed. Right. <laughs> or listening. <laughs> yeah. Um, and actually, um, the other Lauren, I am so sorry. I had a little bit of a brain glitch that I, um, oh, I passed over Mark, um, and I was thinking that Yoab was it, right? <laughs> but you have a presentation. Lauren. You, do, you, do you guys mind if Lauren goes no. first? You're okay, Mark, hanging out a little bit longer? Okay. <laughs> I am so sorry about that. That's why you stood up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so next we're going to do the carbon sequestration <laughs> pilot project. Hi, uh, my name is Lauren Kolb. I'm one of the agricultural management <coughs> coordinators for Open Space and Mountain Parks, and I'm here today to talk about the Carbon Sequestration Pilot Project Feasibility Study. And um, if you'll notice in the title, there's Pilot Project Study. We are in like learning mode here, and so we're trying to figure out, um, in collaboration with Colorado State University and uh, Boulder County Parks and Open Space, the potential for open space land to serve as a carbon sink and um, offer some resiliency and climate change mitigation strategies for the city and county of Boulder. Where am I pointing? Okay. Um, so 
you know, before we get started, I just wanted to point out this article from um, the Washington Post from uh, May 3rd. Uh, we kind of crossed another sad threshold. Um, April 2018 was the first month where um, atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations were above 410 for the entire month. And so um, it seems like we're going up two and a half parts per million per year. And uh, that carbon dioxide is directly linked to a warming planet, a more unpredictable planet. And so we need to be looking at ways of both reducing emissions and also storing more carbon to slow that curve. I'm sure you've seen the entire graph since 1958, and it's kind of scary. Um, so. Uh, in terms of emission reduction scenarios, um, this is from a, a paper from 2016 in Nature. Uh, if, if we just continue with unlimited use of fossil fuels, um, by 2030 we're looking at 66 gigatons of carbon dioxide equivalent per year in emissions, which is very, very high. Um, current trends, we're going about 60 gigatons per year. Um, and the big point of this paper was that the Paris Climate Agreement um, doesn't go far enough. So even with all of every nation but the U.S. agreeing to curb their emissions and doing some modest transportation um, improvements and changes. Um, we're still looking at 53 gigatons <coughs> of carbon dioxide um, emitted, equivalents emitted per year, um, and that still corresponds to three degrees Celsius um, increase in temperature globally by 20, 2100. Um, and so really this paper was pointing to that we need aggressive action to really curb emissions and start sinking more carbon in order to avoid um, that scenario. And so one of the recommendations was, you know, major investments in agriculture and linkages to land use, and that has to do with conversions and obviously deforestation and things like that and clear cutting to make room for agriculture. So, um, so last year, uh, Boulder County, um, under the leadership of Susie Strife, um, we commissioned a report um, with Mark Easter from CSU to look at what we can do in the city and county to use our, our open space lands to sequester carbon, both in the grasslands and rangelands, and also the croplands, fields and forests, and our residential areas. And the questions that they were asking really concerned what agricultural practices are feasible, um, where should they be implemented, how, m how much compost might be available, I'll get more into that, and what is the net greenhouse <coughs> gas benefit um, of, of doing more local composting. And so uh, Mark's group really identified five <coughs> practices that um, they believe can be implemented um, in Boulder County, and they um, concern utilizing compost, spreading that on, on, on lands, um, using slow-release fertilizers, which um, reduce nitrification, uh, using cover crops, which are crops that you plant between cash crops and really function on a number of benefits, um, including weed suppression and, and keeping living roots in the soil to keep the soil from blowing, um, planting windbreaks, and then also um, looking at stripped tillage and reduced tillage to reduce the oxidation of organic matter in the soil. And so taking together all of these techniques, you can kind of call them carbon farming, because not only are we farming for food and, and fiber and things like that, but we're also storing carbon by implementing these practices. And, and they also have a number of ancillary benefits that also help the farmer and rancher, including higher soil organic matter, more yield stability, greater um, soil health. And so that's in that big long checklist there. Um, so looking at those five practices side by side, um, we're looking at the emissions change in, in megagrams of carbon dioxide equivalent per year. That's actually a ton. Um, uh, mending with compost actually, actually provides the most benefit, and so the county and city are really looking towards that for our lands. And the emphasis on carbon and why it's so beneficial in terms of the greenhouse gas equivalents and the reduction in emissions really has to do with diverting food waste, um, ag waste, and manure that would end up in a landfill and cycling that back to farmland. And so that's just a reduction in methane emissions from landfills, and that's where we see that big benefit there. And so the trucking, you know, the trucking of, of that compost is a minor fraction, and really that benefit is about reducing methane from landfill, and that also opens up <coughs> landfill space. So um, on those three different systems, the irrigated cropland, irrigated hay and pasture, and the rangeland, we get that big reduction in um, greenhouse gas emissions from big compost applications there. 
Uh, however, um, compost is, is expensive to purchase and expensive to truck and expensive to spread. And so the cost per acre per year of, of amending with compost actually ends up being the highest of all those um, strategies. Um, and then when you look at the cost per ton of carbon dioxide equivalent reduction, um, it kind of falls in the middle of the pack. And so one of the other things this is trying to do is, is get um, support to have um, the Natural Resources Conservation Service um, help cost share on, on applying compost so that's less expensive for the producer to apply it. So uh, NRCS um, does this equip funding and that's why you see cost per ton with equip and without equip. So they underwrite some of the costs for practices that they know are beneficial for the environment. So um, in this graph you can see the different costs of these different five different <coughs> events, um, with and without equip funding. <coughs> So um, just this one final graph, and you have these all here in case they're not clearly visible. Um, the irrigated cropland has the uh, greatest potential um, for greenhouse gas reductions, followed by irrigated hay and pasture, and then by rangeland. Um, and that's really driven by moisture and then reductions in tillage and then the compost applications. So based on that, the phase one recommendations from the study were to um, do producer-based trials in these three different systems. And so the county is starting this process right now. And so the irrigated cropland is going to have all five treatments. So the compost additions, tillage reduction, slow release fertilizers, cover crops, and windbreaks implemented on a bigger scale so that can be a demonstration for farmers in the area. And then the irrigated hay and pasture will have the three relevant treatments, the compost additions, slow release fertilizers, and windbreaks. And then the rangeland will just receive compost additions because the others are not really relevant or easy to implement. And so just um, really quickly, the associated data that we expect to get include the yield and forage production, um, the management activities, how easy is this to implement, is this feasible for people to implement, the cost of the inputs, um, again, those practice barriers, is this something, if we do find that it works, are people going to adopt it? And then finally, um, lessons learned. So, <laughs> Um, to take this step one, f one to take it one step further, the city of Boulder and open space, um, we're looking at augmenting the study plan to do um, additional treatments on city-owned land, and these um, are kind of outside the scope of Mark Easter's study, but still things that we're interested in as a department and as a city, and possibly might provide a greater benefit in terms of greenhouse gas reduction, and also has a co-benefit of helping us. Um, restore some of these degraded landscapes, whatever the cause. And so um, we're in the process now of working with a um, neighbor on one of our open space properties and setting up um, a treatment scenario that's looking at um, different treatments around soil remineralization, biochar applications, inoculated compost, um, and strategic grazing in order to see if we can store carbon in some of these lands that would otherwise not be used at all. And so just to summarize and talk about next steps, um, this is really a collaborative project. We've been working closely with CSU and Boulder County Parks and Open Space and also in the Natural Resources Conservation Service. And it's really um, beginning to build on some, some efforts that are already ongoing. And so field studies will begin in 2018 and we are gonna have support of the local NRCS office in Longmont. Um, and it's really an opportunity for our department to focus on those degraded ag lands. And so we're excited as an ag staff for that because once they're not in ag, they kind of just are out there and we'd like to see them be productive and keep the soil in place. Um, and talking about these ongoing partnerships, the city, um, the county, NRCS, and Cooperative Extension have been putting on a series of soil health conferences. And so we will be having our third one this December and Dr. David Montgomery is gonna be our keynote speaker. And so we're excited to take the results from the field season in 2018 and present them hopefully in December, both the county and the city project. So. That's the update. Okay, thanks, Lauren. Yeah. Um, any questions, uh, comments? Well, mostly comments. Um, I was able to go to the briefing that was done a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would just say how great it is, I think, <coughs> for doing this. Um, there's a lot of public interest, uh, but I think there's also a lot of maybe misunderstanding of what this process could be all about. I think you and all the other people working on this have got us connected to really smart people that have contacts all over the world uh, working on these issues and are very smart scientists. And so I think um, that's a wonderful thing. Uh, when you 
sometimes when there's a great deal of public interest, you can end up doing things because people are interested in doing them and uh, either coming out with the wrong outcomes or not learning anything. And so I just am delighted that uh, we're working with these folks. Uh, I think they recognize and you folks recognize that um, most of the land we have is not lands that are the most suitable for carbon sequestration and in fact may uh, present real challenges for trying to do uh, improvements in soil health or carbon sequestration without causing as much damage as we would um, in terms of benefit produced. So um, I really appreciate that uh, folks are doing some pilot studies and going into this carefully uh, so that we can move forward really uh, with the scientific basis for what we do. My overall impression, not that it matters, is that if we continue to put a lot of effort into soil health, we'll probably accomplish about 90% of what we would do with carbon sequestration. That's just my sense of this, that uh, that's sort of the pathway that gets you a lot of the benefits of, uh, of carbon sequestration. So anyway, I I'm glad we're doing this. Thanks for all the work you folks are putting into it. I was going to ask, are prairie dogs, uh, I, don't, I get the sense they're not part of this study. It was certainly striking to see Elizabeth Black's presentation. <coughs> would suspect that the Dust Bowl is not a great carbon sink. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> prairie dogs are not part of this intentionally. I think there's some potential for... Um, if these practices work and we can make them work around prairie dog colonies having you know compost additions or if um, inoculated compost help us get vegetation reestablished on those on those colonies to keep the soil in place that would be a great thing so i mean we don't know if this is going to work again we're in learning mode but doing nothing also doesn't work and so i think whether it works or doesn't work i think we're going to learn a lot as a staff and we have the budget set aside we have the budget from our partners and we're um you know with the fiscal constraints we're being very mindful of that and you know soil is, is something you can't make very easily and so we need to keep what's there in place i'm really excited because it's science yeah uh i did have a question i know you you had a slide that you bumped over real quick. That was like the experimental design. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. Yeah, oh, one okay. more. There, no, there, well, there, there, there you go. Um, and then I was just wondering, what's your sample size? So this is a really good question, Ke Kevin. And this was um, one of the things we went back and forth on a lot. And so the they're going to take subsamples within that each plot. So they're going to have two two of each site. And so the rangeland site is actually going to be a replication of ongoing work in California, and they're hoping that that'll just be another um, <coughs> replicate, right? And so they're not true replicates in an experimental sense. That's why on the city of Boulder land, we're going to be doing replicates so that we can say definitively this is significantly different. This is biologically important. Um, I don't know if we'll be able to do that with the cropland hay pasture. Maybe the results will be so compelling that you don't need statistical analysis, maybe it's something that just hits you right between the eyes. And I think that's really reflected in the scale of those two, the plots that you're going to have, you know, a 10 acre control and an 80 acre side by side. And so, um, you know, given that there's so many unknowns about how this is going to work, um, I think the one acre trial is, is a good conservative size in case things go off the rail in terms of weeds. So um, I think for what we have and the resources we have, this is kind of the best that we can do. And following up on that, is there a reason why you want to do, I mean, you have like a 10 acre control and an 80 acre um, treatment as opposed to a bunch of one acre controls and a bunch of eight acre treatments spread out or randomly placed so that you have better management of um, your other variables? That's a really good point, and I've brought that up. Um, and this is what the county and CSU have decided to do. Um, and I think they're just relying on that re repeated measures over time and treating this as a kind of a real like ecosystem experiment rather than a real like ag experiment where we would do a, a study more like you're describing. And I think just also ease of implementation and then the demonstration of that scale. I, th I think that's the reasoning behind that. Okay. okay. 
I would I would reject that paper if it was. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Mark Davison. Uh, un Time's up. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, Darren Wagner is not well today, and um, tell me about it. Oh uh, <laughs> yes, sorry, Kevin. <laughs> uh, and uh, Mark Davison's going to <coughs> pinch hit. Thank you, Tracy. Um, I would like to acknowledge, as well as Darren, uh, the folks Juliet Benell, Mark Gershman, Brian Annika are in the front row tonight to help answer questions and. Want to appreciate the input they've put into this effort to date. Okay, I'm here to chat about uh, three things tonight. The community engagement so far, the uh, preliminary draft focus areas, and also the next steps. Just to, uh, it's always good to check in where we're at. You can see the diagram up on the screen. And it tells us we've got through the system overview section and we're moving into the focus areas. After that, we'll be moving into developing the strategies. In terms of the engagement summary, um, I think, you know, after following Yohab, I feel a bit humble. I'm not sure I'll be able to do it justice. <laughs> and in terms of the type of work they did is, frankly, an example of uh, support we got from the process committee um, in terms of taking an inclusive approach, which was including reaching out to youth. And I think that's a great example. <coughs> in total, we had uh, 2,000 people who we directly reached. And I think that really sort of reflects the effort that staff put in to reach out to the community and also listen to the community. I want to make sure, uh, as board members, you do have the executive summary tonight. And also, anyone in the audience who doesn't have this, it's available if someone would like to pick it up. And that will be our reference for you as we get into the focus areas. But we did also release on May 7th the draft findings report, which is this report here for folks. And that explains the engagement process we used. And frankly, to get to the point where we're at now, I want to be real clear that the focus areas and the related topics truly reflect the public comment we received. There's been an in-depth process by staff to analyze all the comments in this draft findings under Appendix A and Appendix B. All the public comments are included, so folks can see transparency there in terms of <coughs> what people said and then how they came to emerge as focus areas and related topics. During the engagement process, we really um, Frankly, Kurt, thank you. Uh, we did have some innovative approaches, but as part of the process committee, Kurt pointed out we should still use our traditional process. And that led to the open house you see before you, about 100 people attended. Uh, it was a great example for people to go through examples of the system overview report, which is, again, part of this initial window to provide the information to get feedback from people. As you can see there, the bottom left picture, uh, even in that type of effort, we were trying to reach out to youth through what is a traditional open house. And we didn't get many youth at that thing, but it was that sort of start of that process to engage more folk. I think uh, a big success was a Mahina open space effort. Uh, I think how many, 400 people perhaps attended that day. Uh, Jeff and Paige do attract a good crowd. <laughs> But in truth, um, it was great to see the way it was organized in the sense of, yes, there was entertainment, but as you noticed, I think the folks that attended, the tables were set up to really get valuable feedback from the community. We moved into something new for us, and I think this was really helpful. It was the idea of micro-engagements, and this is really where the inclusiveness began to uh, show itself in our process. Uh, you'll see on the bottom right an example at a trailhead of a micro-engagement where Deb Cushman is actually reaching out to people directly to get input on the master plan. We did it uh, working with the Latinx community, uh, people experiencing disability. And the idea is that staff, when they typically do a program, uh, let's say it's on environmental education, we're basically tagging on the master plan process to reach out to communities we don't typically work with. and. I think that is a model, frankly, uh, we can use in the future and will continue to use because it really does create that diverse array of comments. We also reached out to senior centers, uh, email to rec recreation organizations in the black community, uh, 
We did radio outreach to the Spanish-speaking community. Um, in other words, all of these efforts are pretty new for us, but it was us trying to model the new city's approach for engagement, and we really do appreciate the process committee pushing us to go in this route. Uh, it was nice to read, feed, hear feedback from two council members. Uh, one said it's the best engagement they've seen in a department citywide process, and the other said it could be a model for the city, so credit the staff for that effort. Okay, we get to the fun part, the draft focus areas. <laughs> What I'd recommend is using the executive summary um, <coughs> just to guide you if you can't read what's on the screen. And we came up with uh, five focus areas that reflect the community comment. Ecosystem health, and that basically is the top piece of this focus area, the two-worder as it were, is the title. And then underneath we used a description which was using the words we heard from the community when they talked about what was important to them, the value statement. And during that process, we basically took all the comments in terms of related topics, as in grouping them, you know, you lump and split, lump and split, it's an iterative process. But the related topics reflect sort of individual phrases that came through, individual hopes, concerns, and they led to the second line, which is more like the sentence, the value statement, and then the top line is the topic. So the first one is ecosystem health, Using the best available science, we protect healthy ecosystems and mend those we have impaired. For, in terms of the excuse me, in terms of the related topics to that, it is interesting. You know, we do have the survey out at the moment, which went out on, uh, I believe it was released on May 9th, and it'll close on May 20th. And what we're hearing so far is things that people are seeing as important in those related topic areas based on what we've heard back from the survey so far is protecting biodiversity, protecting natural sounds and night skies, and safeguarding large habitat blocks. The second focus area, draft focus area that's emerged is resilience <coughs> environmental change. We've heard quite a bit about that tonight. It is an emerging topic in terms of over the last 10 years as opposed to the last 50 years of the department. And in terms of a value statement, it's by helping nature endure and thrive, we ourselves endure and thrive. And actually what we're hearing in there in terms of related topics as the public seeing is quite important so far is mitigating fire and flood risks uh, and exploring carbon sequestration, two topics you heard from tonight. The third focus area is enjoyment and recreation management. And the value statement is we are united by our enjoyment of nature and our obligation to protect it. What we're hearing from the public again in that area in terms of the related topics is importance on carrying capacity and visitation growth, how we manage that from both a potential impact to nature but the ensuring an enjoyable experience. And also <coughs> uh, maintaining trails and facility condition is coming up as an important topic. For the fourth focus area, it is community connections and inclusion. And the value statement is together, we build a community of stewards and seek to find our place in nature. Uh, the related topic that is popping up there is the connection to youth in nature. Uh, specifically, you know, we've heard about nature deficit disorder. And then also we've heard quite a bit of few comments on connecting communities to agriculture. The final focus area is uh, perhaps more an operational one, and we still heard about this from community, but we did leave room as we developed these, obviously based upon uh, the system overview report and staff knowledge, the scientists in our department, the budget managers, the planners, you, you name it, the trail uh, folk, is there is room in these focus areas to include how we manage the land from a staff pers perspective. So obviously financial sustainability came through from a staff perspective is very strong. Uh, the value statement is preserving our legacy land system requires preparing for the future. And a couple of things that popped up were ant anticipating sunsetting taxes, uh, diversifying new and potential funding sources, as well as updating the asset management systems, which we've actually begun the process of. So those are the five focus areas that have emerged. Uh, I'll move into the next steps at this point before we can stop and pause for questions. Uh, we are looking to 
basically wrap up the uh, public <coughs> comment. If anyone would like to still comment on these focus areas, it will be May the 20th, and there's an online survey, and that's up on this slide you'll see in the second line, osmpmasterplan.org is where you'll find that questionnaire. Please, folk, complete that. The more we get, the better. And then from there, we'll be uh, heading into a period where we go to a joint study session, and at some point, we'll be approving these focus areas before we move into the strategy window. The way that will work is basically there will be on June 12th a joint study session with the board and council. Um, from that, no at, at that meeting, I just want to be clear, no decisions will be made at that meeting. It's just getting input. And then we will have on June 13th, if we can't fully resolve all matters at that joint study session or things emerge that need a little bit more study, we're leaving room on June 13th for the board meeting to have a study session to look at whatever comes out of that, if there is additional things we need to look at. From there, we'll move into board and council approval of focus areas. And with that, we'll then be able to move into the idea of the related topics which are included aren't being approved by, recommended by the board or the council, but the related topics will give us guidance as to where to focus next in terms of the strategy development, taking the deeper dives. So with that, I'd ask for any questions or thoughts or comments. It may be worth clarifying um, uh, your expectations on comments on the focus areas themselves. I don't think that's what we're planning to do at this meeting, but I just want to make sure we're all clear on, you know, what it is you're expecting at this meeting as distinguished from the, you know, the two study sessions, uh, well, the two June meetings, one of which is a study session. Yeah, no, tonight was merely an update, just the fact that we're in an engagement window still and looking for the public to comment on this. It was just a chance to reveal what we found and then, yeah, give you any comments on any process or anything in the, everything you'd like to see in addition to what we've already done. Um, I guess I have some thoughts, and I agree with you that uh, we're not going to try to refine the, your proposals here. I guess I'm thinking ahead mostly to the council meeting. Um, I don't know if it's typical to have a study session with council when it's the first time that the board and council is looking at the information. And so I, I will admit I have some concern about that, that we're, it, it might feel like we really haven't done our homework and we're not bringing to the council, the board that is, not <coughs> staff, uh, a view on this and a recommendation or something like that. I don't know how council will feel about that. That's something I, I guess I do have a concern about. Um, the other thing is, and you know, this is an issue we've talked about uh, some for a long time, is uh, are we going to end up with 50 focus areas? And what a frightening nightmare that would be. Uh, but right now we may have the opposite end, which is that we have five. And I think it wouldn't be a surprise if a council member looked at these and said, well, every possible issue open space has ever addressed or will address could be put under these. So. Have we focused anything? Uh, we simply have categories now that you can put <coughs> any issue within. And so they might ask us, well, what are you going to do with these? And uh, it did prompt me to go back and look at what we've told the public so far about what focus areas are for. And really, we haven't told them very much. All we've said is that these focus areas will provide a foundation for the development of the master plan strategies um, and that these are themes to guide uh, open space management over the next decade. But I, I do think this question of what is a focus area and what is it meant to do, it would be wonderful if we had really crisp and uh, uh, clear descriptions and definitions, frankly, that we all agreed on that we could take to council so that when council says, well, what is a focus area or what is a focus area not? Uh, I mean, how are you going to explain to the public what it means to put a focus in the future on ecosystem health? Aren't we doing that already? Uh, if you do more of that, are you going to do less of something else? Is this to take from a, you know, a certain pot of money that's been set aside for high priorities? 
I don't think we have answers to any of those things right now. And <coughs> boy, it would be great if we had some proposed definitions to address those questions before we get to council. And you know, uh, you when you look at the schedule, you can see that we are not meeting as a group until that meeting or that study session. And so I worry, are we going to have enough preparation and structure at that meeting to really make it worth council's time? That's my concern. So I know it's a lot, but I thought I'd put it out there. No, I appreciate it, Kurt. Um, I think it's a, a fair point you're making. I've, one of the, the reasons we've set up the joint session, study session through approval from, well, input from the process committee, is that is the first time. But it, if you think about it in this sense, we could have gone to council separately and yourself separately to talk about the focus areas. We said, let's combine that. And then, was, if you remember, we're still coming back in July to the OSBT, OSBT then to discuss the focus areas based upon that discussion, the joint discussion. So that's when we can deliberate and get into more detail and provide, to answer the second part of your question, a lot more clarity. You know, the focus areas in some ways are setting up, a, um, they are community input based, they do reflect the comments directly from the community. Right. And they are setting up a, uh, if you like, a problem statement that the strategies will deal with and start to answer questions around those focus areas. We then have in August, the council then, you know, obviously making a decision on those focus areas. So from June 12th to August 7th, we've got two months to get into the detail of that. Uh, I, I appreciate that we are taking at that point the public's input, which has just ended. Mm -hmm. We're all seeing it at the same time. That's fine. I do think we could do more to make it clear to the council how we're going to use these focus areas. Because I think it's obvious, you could have 30 problem statements from each one. Right. And how does that in inform a process that gets you to a master plan? Uh, by making that clear, it sort of forces us to come to grips with how we're going to use these things. And I think having that thought through at least for illustration purposes, before the council uh, study session with us would be really helpful. Great. So otherwise, this could be a very vague uh, conversation. <coughs> and um, frankly, I think it might be a little annoying to council if they keep asking us, well, what do you want these things to do? And we can't tell them. Uh, so appreciate the feedback. We'll oh, sure. definitely incorporate that. And I don't know why the process committee didn't figure this out. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, Kurt. I, I mean, I'm always a big fan of examples, and what Kurt gave, I think, is a great way. You could say, like, as an example, if we choose ecosystem health, here's how that would be translated into the master plan and then application, and why it needs to be categorized as ecosystem health instead of just saying, here's some things we should do. Might, might actually be really helpful in terms of, like, because as I read through these, I thought, you guys hadn't think anything about staff in any of this, like how to have healthy staff that's very competent and does a great job. None of that, that's not a priority here, but like great, great ideas. And you like, well, we're just going to hire everyone who dropped out of high school and, you know, doesn't know what they're doing. None of these things are going to happen. So I think that, you know, I could come up with a list of 40 different focus areas, but none of those without a clear idea of how they're applied would really matter. So, um, Anyway, I, I think that that would be a great thing of like, here's what we think this would actually translate into. That's great, Kevin. That that will, yeah, definitely incorporate your suggestion and Kurt's suggestion to provide more clarity. And if you could get some cannolis for the meeting yeah. too. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I think it, it, it probably is true that our typical, we don't have that many study sessions with council, but usually there is some level of uh, board input reflected in whatever it is they're reviewing. Um, and I, I don't know if you're suggesting that we try to get, um, have another meeting um, between now and whenever that would be a challenge to hold a board meeting and then have staff revise. I think that's to revise the focus areas in a way that would then get it to uh, that into the for the June 12th study session is probably not my guess is not very realistic I would agree. yeah I think it, you know um, we can just make clear at the study session and you know it's not a defensive sort of thing but you know 
where we are in the process. And they're on the, you know, two council members are on the process committee. They know, um, you know, at a general level where this document fits into the, the board's process. And, you know, um, obviously you'll have board members <coughs> offering suggestions as well. Uh, you know, I think, I think we can navigate that. Oh, we have to. Yeah. Or, and I'm not <laughs> worried so much about us processing the content as the, the process about where we're going forward. Um, I think if we had a greater clarity about that, uh, even if it's just the staff's proposal, I think that would be really helpful to be able to think about as we start talking about these areas. Was there more that you wanted to say on this subject? No, we were just happy to provide the update. Okay. Because I, th I um, yeah, I think that then transitions into matters from the board, the first of which is the process committee. I don't know. <laughs> that, uh, well, it, it, I'm not sure there's a <coughs> great deal to add, but Kevin and I were at the last, so we're now just <laughs> reporting to you. And um, a large portion of that meeting, was discussing how to format and sort of structure the focus areas, uh, but that is now reflected in what you've seen. I don't, okay. I don't think I need to sort of diagram how we got from the process committee meeting to this output. I think it pretty well reflects um, what, how we were envisioning the, the focus areas. We didn't talk about substance, but just conceptually how that would be structured. Um, and then, you know, one specific, comment was how to avoid having focus areas where we're going to spend a huge amount of time debating the exact wording of something with the f belief that if you influence precise mm. choices of words, you maybe get an outcome. And I think you've actually done a pretty good, you know, there's always <coughs> room, uh, but I think you've actually done a good job of coming up with descriptions of focus areas that tell the reader sort of what this is about without appearing to kind of tilt the scale on well, what ought to be done about this particular thing. And I, you know, we'll see how this plays out, but I think the process committee was interested, and I think this is a step in the right direction, in avoiding a situation where the process of sort of fleshing out the focus area really becomes a not more than just a preview, but actually the sort of first round of discussion about what the end result ought to be, and I think this gives us a good way of kind of avoiding that, you know, potentially giant detour. Um, there was also a lot of discussion on uh, the online questionnaire, but that too is now um, in existence. So, um, you know, it, one of the things that got added was this notion of other things, you know, that we've missed, and that's now picked up. And the questionnaire, I think, faithfully reflects the input um, uh, from the process committee meeting. And I think the third was um, going over the schedule, which um, I think it was Darren, uh, in response, frankly, to a quest that I made, put the schedule in our packet. The um, So we have. Um, you know, after this meeting, the engagement window closes on May 20th. We've got a process committee meeting May 23rd um, with the study session with council and our board meeting the next night. Then the one thing I wanted to call out was that the June 27th uh, process committee meeting was at least tentatively, I think the discussion at the meeting was to tentatively cancel that. Um, and uh, uh, that's during, I think, the council during their um, during their break, and it's been deleted from this schedule. And then, you know, I think we're on, should be on target for um, the July 11th board vote on the focus areas. I don't, I don't think the process committee meeting uh, had any, you know, there were no seismic shifts. It was, you know, just getting the focus areas um, underway, getting the questionnaire underway, and, um, you know, deleting the one process committee meeting, but otherwise, status quo. Okay. 
Oh, and then there was some discussion about, and you may have this already, about the plan for the study session itself with council. Um, no, I so don't think I Anna Layborn will be our facilitator. Um, we can provide this to you, but okay. the, you know, the vision is that it's a two hour study session and it'll be broken down by focus area. Um, there was a thought that we would, it would be almost a go around the room, but that's, that's 14 people and five focus areas. My, I'm not the facilitator, but I have a feeling that may get too much. <laughs> that we may have to shorten that process, or, the, uh, or maybe it's just a lot of me too's. Um, but you know, there are 14 people there, and the fact that the board hasn't previously <coughs> weighed in affects that dynamic somewhat. Um, Obviously, we have the ability to um, be in a little bit more of listening mode because we have our own meeting the next night, whereas right. this is council's right. one shot to influence this before it comes to them for a vote. But I think to some extent we're going to have to play that dynamic by ear and rely on the facilitator a little bit. But um, if everybody says everything they want to say on five focus areas which <coughs> cover a large portion of open space, we're not getting out of there in two hours. <laughs> and I think we are getting out. I think the, the two hour limit uh, time cut off is a, is a hard stop. So, you know, have to be careful on that. And I think this, you know, this schedule had the effect of perhaps giving us a slightly larger window for the, when we start uh, for the strategies, which I, I think given the relatively high level nature of the focus areas is appropriate. But it's going to, you know, the strategies are going to be a much a much deeper and I think probably more complex dive. It's, you know, my own sense is it's pretty easy to just, in, if someone says, hey, I'd like you to add to a focus area X the following topic, it's pretty easy to, to, to add that. That's not a lot of work. And when you come to identifying strategies to carry out that, something you just added, that, you know, that is a lot of work. You know, I think the, you, you focused my attention on that uh, June 12, June 13, back to back. And uh, to me, that does suggest that we should focus June 12 to make sure we hear counsel. Yeah. I, that they give us all the advice, even if it's general advice, uh, that they can give us. Because we have the next day to try to process yes. that. So I, I, I just wanted to underline that point. And there, I agree. And I, I did want to, you know, we are under some real time constraints and we have our own venues. There was a proposal to have an open house before the study session and um, Aaron Brockett, who was the one council member at the process committee, felt that that wasn't a great idea in terms of transparency, that, um, that our discussions ought to be, you know, even though an open house is by definition open to the public, the public doesn't really hear the discussion. Um, it's and uh, he wanted something, and I think we were fine with not doing that, but that, yeah. that concept did get raised. Um, which uh, transitions directly into the next topic I wanted to quickly raise. Oh, absolutely. Can I add a couple things? To oh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, so um, since it was my one shot at the meeting, <laughs> yeah. because, you know, you, you weren't able to be, um, so the the one thing that I brought You're up, empowered by I was in, I was empowered by my one my one time there. Um, basically, what I advocated for were two things. Um, yeah, exactly. I want that back. Um, the first one was is that I pointed out that a lot of the time when they do this sort of surveys like the kind that's out right now, you have um, multimodal results. So we have norms where people feel very differently about things, and so the average ends up being a three, and half the people said one, and half the people said five. And that's a much, it's much more important to know that you have ones and fives and hardly any threes than the average was three. So I requested that they do, do, do a, a better analysis to get us a sense of that. Another thing is to see correlations between things. So do people generally prioritize questions one, three, and five all the same way? They all like it and they, or they all don't like it. So we have a sense of how these different questions interplay. Um, and then the last thing I said was that for people like me who love this sort of stuff, make the data available as a spreadsheet that's downloadable so that people can do their own stats with it. 
you can put it as a Google spreadsheet or something, because essentially what the survey is going to do is deliver a spreadsheet to staff um, that's digital, make that digital spreadsheet available so that people can do their own analysis and see whatever they want. Hopefully they don't abuse that, but that was my thinking is that like, I'd like to do a principal components analysis. I would love to do this distributional data. I don't want to make staff do that, but I know a lot of people really want to chew on this and making that available is not a big extra, you know, it's maybe 10 or 15 minutes extra work to do it. Those were my things that I brought up at my one chance at power at the meeting. Um, so, um, but other than that, I thought it was great. It was a really interesting meeting and I feel, I think, you know, really great that it's going forward the way it is. So now I'm ready for you to go okay, out so, here. So I was going to raise the, uh, the question of whether we um, do or don't want to have a retreat. The, the reason I'm raising this is that it, it, the retreat had been described as really about the master plan, and I wanted to raise two concerns. I don't want to overstate the strength of this, but I do want to raise two concerns about this. The one is to build up the transparency point from a few minutes ago in that retreats really are not a very, uh, I mean, yes, they're open to the public. They're not well attended. They're not well attended. They're not televised, so you can't watch it live and you can't watch it tape. And they take place at a time of day when very few people um, are actually available. And a retreat, to me, works as a good vehicle if you're discussing board dynamics, maybe discussing some priorities and some getting some advice from the city attorney's office and some things like that that, you know, yes, they're public, but they are not necessarily things that the public is viewing as high priorities where they really want input and want to hear a substantive discussion. So that's my concern about kicking a, a real <coughs> major intro to the sort of the substance of the master plan to a retreat when we've got a lot of study sessions already scheduled. Those are, you know, at our usual time when people who wish to participate expect to, you know, that we're going to be here, will be televised, and it's an easy vehicle for them, you know, to attend and listen. And they can also do, there's always public participation, you know, that night. And, um, I guess I believe that we can cover the material in the con. I mean, we're having meetings every month on the master plan. Um, that we can cover that material without a standalone retreat, and you know that we also be mindful of staff resources. Um, we're losing uh, two uh, hugely valuable people for this process, and there's a uh, there's always a million other things going on, and the retreats, of, you know. It's a time-consuming undertaking to have people spend a good portion of a work day and all that, you know, goes into getting prepared for that. So I just want to, one is to make sure you, I have not mischaracterized sort of the vision of the retreat and to make, get our sense of, is this something maybe we don't need to do or at least play it by ear? And if it starts to feel like, geez, we're getting way behind on these study sessions and our meetings <coughs> really need to do, a, you know, something on the side that we can do it. But I don't know that I want to plan on uh, moving a large portion of the substance to a retreat. So, yeah. so if I understand, um, we have often done a retreat each year to do more of the administrative things. And in this case, it was becoming more of a single subject retreat. Are you suggesting we might still do a retreat, but not on the master plan? Is that... And maybe on a different... Well, I think if there are other topics that people feel are retreat worthy, I'm... Um, yeah, you know, yeah, entirely open. I think that's a discussion probably that yeah. um, we want the full board to uh, see what topics they would like to discuss. But I would say at that point, if we believe we can cover the master plan without a retreat, then I would want, I would suggest that any other topics sort of arise because people really feel a need. I mean, sometimes people say, well, let's just have a retreat. And then, yeah, if we're going to have a retreat, it's not hard to fill the time. But I think that's, bad. that's the cart before the horse. Why don't we do it the other way? Why are you doing this? And then, you know, figure out what, what the, the structure is. And sometimes, and candidly, although she's not here, but I think I have no problem saying this, sometimes the retreat is about the fact that you have a new mm -hmm. board member who is relatively new, but that's, you know, Karen's obviously extremely knowledgeable all this stuff. We don't, we don't need to hold it for that purpose. Good point. 
Uh, Tom shared this concern right. with us at our agenda setting meeting, and um, w staff's proposal uh, really in place of a retreat, and maybe we should just get rid of the term retreat, <laughs> is to really have a work session on the master plan. And uh, we did follow up with the master plan staff team, and they actually thought, and Mark, correct me if I'm wrong, that their the staff team believes it would be worthwhile to have a work session in the latter half of July. I'm sorry, in the, oh, the latter half of August, okay. Okay. Right. Okay, so I think the, dis well, my suggestion would be the discussion of, since now we're talking about, we had originally been talking about July and that had some real immediacy to it. If we're now talking about something that doesn't take place until August and the question is, can that be accomplished in the context of a study session, a, a longer study session, or does that require a standalone? I would think that's a discussion we might as well have the whole board yeah. here for. But okay. so are you okay with leaving that where that is, or do you need something more definitive from the three of us? You, fine. I think we have time. Okay. Time to figure that one out. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> I had one quick matter from the board. Just after tonight's um, brief presentation about the uh, risks of equestrian um, traffic uh, to equestrians, uh, in the Sanitas area, um, maybe it's time to start just putting on the back burner the idea of trail difficulty ratings. Um, a lot of communities around Colorado have been doing this for decades, where just like ski resorts, it's green, blue, black, and that's a really low cost ad, and that might alleviate some of the risks of someone riding a horse or a bike or hiking or whatever on a really hard trail when they're not really ready for that. I got a comment? I could address that, actually. Um, Francis Bolding, who did the <laughs> condition assessment, has been working just on that exact topic and has started to come up with some really interesting stuff, and I hope that we might have a chance to share with that with you soon. So, right. Awesome. This is the best ever. And I would just <laughs> add on the... Uh, it was there the last time I looked, but it's been some time. <coughs> on the website, um, under accessibility, there actually is a very detailed, and I, I, I think very good, rating system. Uh, but that's from the perspective of someone who's mobility limited, mm -hmm. um, which is a different sort of categorization than among the trails that are already moderately challenging. What are the gradations um, within that? Um, but that, at least, uh, a portion of that exists. It's not something that appears on the signs or on the maps, um, yeah. but it does exist. And I actually think it's very good in that it doesn't view ability as a simple binary, um, but rather re recognizes gradations that some trails will work for people with some levels of ability, but not for others. Some of us that are really old can <laughs> remember what the rating is on most of the trails because there used to be trail rating signs, uh, and the, some were red and some were. But I agree, it needs to be on a sign because if you go to all trails, it'll tell you there's this wonderful little family hike up to Royal Arch, and <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> and that's, you know, there's nothing that says <coughs> suitable only for or anything like that. So having it on the sign, I think, is really valuable. Yeah. Well, and, and it's, I mean, like I said, it's becoming pretty commonplace for a lot of municipalities and communities in yeah. Colorado. So it's not like we're inventing a wheel. And some of those trails, the rating is very much a function of whether it's icy or not. Royal oh. Arch is a good one, yeah, an example, good example of that. Yes. Yeah. We just have a little thing that says like icy, like mm. double diamond, mm. yeah. you know. Any, any other matters from the board? That's wow. Well, uh, Tracy. Yeah. Can I just mention one little thing, and I didn't want to make it, you know, matters from staff and, but I know you all got an announcement that I'm retired. Yes. What? Um, <laughs> and I just, um, really quick, because I know we just have a few folks and everything, but I just wanted to 
you know, it's been very fortunate for me to have this career at the city. It's been wonderful. Um, I'm also very fortunate that I get to make myself available to a different possibility in the future. So um, this is very much a personal decision. Um, you know, one of the things they say is that um, you want to try to work yourself out of a job. And I feel like I've done that and that there's this staff team here that's just <coughs> outstanding, you know, really second to none. And Dan and Steve as your interim uh, leaders with the team that the bench that they have, you know, the people that are here and then the bench behind the people who are here, just remarkable. And you are in such good hands. I have no doubts whatsoever. And I just want to tell you publicly, I know it's just a few of you tonight, but it's been an honor to serve with you. Um, and when I graduated from college, I had so much fun. I loved college and I cried so much. You wouldn't believe it. And I've been here more than seven times longer than I was in college. So if I made this a long goodbye, it'd be like seven plus times the tears that I should. <laughs> and, I, and I can't do that. And my daughter wants my graduation goggles to be on for a really short time. <laughs> so thank you for everything you all are, have been fantastic to work with. <laughs> oh. Thank you. And we prom no, no long goodbyes from us either. Certainly, yeah. I think, I'm sure I speak for all of us that we were surprised and saddened uh, to learn of your imminent departure. Um, the, uh, it's, you know, in some ways, the two most important things for any leader are to first leave the organization better than you found it. And you inherited an organization, you know, that had a you know, considerable history of success. So you were starting from a high point, and I think you've absolutely left this organization better than you found it in a number of dimensions that we're, you know, for which we are very grateful. And the other responsibility of any leader um, is to, you know, make sure that there is a plan of succession that you have uh, succeeded in replacing yourself. <coughs> and, you know, while we don't get involved in personnel matters, I think we feel, we all feel very good about um, the people, uh, both that you've inherited uh, and who are still with us, Jim back there, and uh, Steve, um, and some others. I don't mean to be so selective. Mark, of course, sorry. As well as others that you've brought on board that you have, a, you know, a very strong team in place. And, you know, I think we're feeling very good about uh, where things are, you, uh, if I could, uh, your first meeting was a real, was a disastrous meeting, not because of you, but you just happened to witness one of the low points in the battles over the North TSA, and I promised that it would not normally be like that, and I'd like to think uh, <laughs> that has uh, proven true, but it's also true that um, I think a lot of dynamics have been improved, you know, very much by the attitude that you brought to this. Um, and uh, I, uh, Kurt wrote up some additional thoughts, um, and I very much joined in them, but I also wanted to read these uh, to you in addition to what I just said. Uh, Tracy, um, and this isn't longer maudlin, I promise. Um, uh, we will miss you, miss very much your leadership and your collegiality. We offer our very best wishes for all of your future endeavors. Your accomplishments and 28 years of service to the city have been well documented. The board would like to add our personal thanks for the many things you have done to make our work easier, such as treating all of our questions seriously, no matter how uninformed they might be, <laughs> hiring, developing, and empowering great staff who also treated all of our questions seriously, no matter how uninformed they might be, always including us as advisors and colleagues in important strategic decisions, making extra effort to provide the board with both the information that we need and the time and study sessions necessary to give informed advice, this one especially, always bringing a positive outlook and sense of humor to even the most difficult issues and decisions, making a sustained and successful effort to create the OSMP asset inventory and financial analyses needed to guide the challenging choices we are now facing, 
And lastly, as a token of our appreciation and by the power invested in the board, we grant you a free lifetime pass to all OSMP trails, <laughs> as well as all of our board meetings. Thank you uh, for your service. Tom, Thank I, you. I wouldn't mind just speaking a little bit on behalf of the staff. I don't know if any other staff can <coughs> say anything, but I don't think I've ever told you this story. But uh, so I, I spent uh, my past 20 years before I came to the city uh, as executive director for a land conservation group in Wisconsin. And so a decision to uproot and go anywhere was a very difficult one. But I decided to throw my ring in the, in the hat and apply for a position here with Open Space and Mountain Parks over almost three years ago. And, uh, to give you a little clue on how the interview process works, you you kind of do a, a little walk through a maze of different buildings and di different hallways. And I started off when an interview around a table with probably some of the colleagues here that I, I maybe didn't know was in that room and did my half hour interview there. And then I got ushered into another room where another group of colleagues sat and went through about a 35, 45 minute interview there. And then finally I got ushered down the hallway and it turns out it was uh, the opportunity to speak for 10 minutes to the director. And it was my opportunity, and I didn't know that that opportunity was gonna come, but to say what I wanted and for Tracy to listen and comment for about 10 minutes. And uh, I walked out of that conversation convinced that this is the place I wanna work at. Um, Tracy looked me in the eyes, she was so genuine. Uh, the questions she asked me were sincere. And I sincerely walked out of that building, went to the car and called my wife and said, this is the place I want to work. Mm -hmm. I'm offered the job. And uh, it's because Tracy, you're a, you're a woman of deep integrity. And the one thing I really learned and uh, that I respect so much is what she values more than anything else is organizational health. Yeah. Yeah. And there's nothing more important than the health of an organization. You could, you could have all the plans you want. You could have all the... Uh, great ideas, but if you don't have organizational health, they'll never get implemented. And that's what Tracy was committed to over her three, four years here at Open Space and Mountain Parks and her 27 years at the city. So thank you for everything you've done. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. All right, we're adjourned. Paris, on France 24.